Well, good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item of the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones. They may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, however, committee members and so on may be using tablets for uh, providing meeting papers in digital format. Uh, next, I would like to say uh, a few words about uh, Nigel Don because I welcome to the committee Michael Russell. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank Nigel Don for his hard work and contribution during his time with Raki and wish him well in his new role with the Public Audit Committee. They've gained a true statistician. And with that, I move on to agenda item one, which is a declaration of interests. I welcome Michael Russell as the new member of the committee and ask him to declare any relevant interests. Thank you. I can't use the system. Uh, quite effectively. Thank you, convener. I, I declare three relevant interests. I was a director of them, and I'm a member of the Colin Tribe and Glendale Development Trust. I am a member of our Gal Community Housing Association, which uh, is involved in the provision of rural housing, and I have a contract with the Scottish Hydro SSE for the provision of uh, renewable energy through solar panels. And I suppose the less relevant one is I'm a former environment minister, but thank you for your welcome too. Not at all. Welcome to the committee. Um, agenda item two is a decision on taking business in private. Just to be clear, this second item is to decide whether consideration of its draft budget 2015-16 report, which we've already taken evidence in public on, should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, agenda item three, subordinate legislation. Today, uh, the committee is to consider the Negative Instrument South Arran Marine Conservation Amendment Order 2014, SSI 2014 stroke 297. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to this instrument, and I refer members to the paper and ask if there are any comments, please. Mike Russell. Convener, simply one comment. Uh, in somebody who has a constituency interest in this area of sea, there was a difficulty with creel fishermen who were not consulted at the start of the process. This was a process that was truncated uh, and very urgent. But I do think in future, when drafting takes place, the interests of all users of the marine environment should be borne in mind. The creel fishermen had to, went through a period of some considerable worry to discover whether or not they would still be able to access the waters. Licenses are, I now understand, being given. But I think for the future, it should be noted. I think it's very useful. And... Uh Fortunately, we have the relevant minister here, I think, at the moment. Maybe not, but I'm sure we'll be able to pass it on to, the, to Richard Lockhead uh, to remind him about that. So, um, are the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? We are agreed. Thank you. <coughs> and now, um, Dr Aileen MacLeod, Minister for Environment, Climate Change and land reform has joined us for the first time. Welcome to your post, Minister. Thank you. And um, the, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to congratulate you on your new role. And we welcome you very much and look forward to working with you. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the previous Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, for all his valued contribution to the committee's work and wish him all the best in his new role. Agenda item four is subledge. Um, uh, it's in welcoming the new minister to give evidence on the Public Water Supplies Scotland Regulation 2014 draft. This instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before provisions may come into force. And following this evidence session, the committee will be invited to consider the motion to approve the instrument under agenda item five. So I welcome uh, the minister <coughs> and uh, her uh, official Sue Petch, Deputy Director, Drinking Water Quality Division in the Scottish Government. Angus MacDonald wishes to make a point. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I feel obliged to declare an interest. Uh, I should declare a non pecuniary interest uh, in that a close family member in Stornoway has an action against Scottish Water in the Court of Session which relates to water quality. Uh, therefore, I'll be recusing myself from items three and four uh, and take no part in it. Uh, items four and five. Uh, no, three and four. 
Oh, oh. yeah, it's all right. The, the, the current agenda that I'm working from is four and five. But we know what you mean. It's this item. No bother. Thank you very much for that. Right, um, the Minister, do you wish to uh, make a, a statement about the instrument, please? Um, yes, I do. Um, convener, um, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to make some opening remarks. Um, before I do, I would uh, like to put on record uh, how much I am looking forward uh, to working with the committee in my new role, and I am keen to be as helpful as I can be with the work of the committee and I'm sure I will be a regular visitor to this committee and I'm very much looking forward uh, to working with you all. Now, I should also add that I have with me this morning uh, Sue Petch, who's our Deputy Director of our Drinking Water Quality Division, who may also uh, help to answer some of the committee's questions. Now, in Scotland, 97% of the population receives water from public water supplies, which are provided by Scottish Water. The other 3% of the population receive their water from private water supplies. These supplies are regulated under private water supply regulations. As you are aware, Scottish Water is a statutory body which delivers drinking water to 2.4 million households throughout the country. Water provided by Scottish Water for human consumption purposes must meet the same quality standards regardless of the size of the supply or its location in Scotland. Now, the main purpose of these regulations is to ensure the quality of Scotland's drinking water continues to be of a high standard which satisfy the requirements of the EU Drinking Water Directive. And in particular, the regulations aim to protect human health from the adverse effects of any contamination of water supplied by Scottish Water. They do so by setting out the requirements to be met and how these may be enforced so that consumers receive a supply of safe and clean drinking water. The requirements of the Drinking Water Directive in relation to public water supplies in Scotland are currently implemented by the Water Supply Water Quality Scotland Regulations 2001 and various amendments. And I believe that it's timely to replace those existing regulations with a new set of consolidated regulations to aid transparency and to enable some revisions and new provisions to be introduced. Now, the new provisions include, firstly, a requirement to risk assess each treatment works and its connected supply. And although provision for risk assessment was not included previously, Scottish Water has been risk assessing its treatment works since 2006 as a requirement of the directions that Scottish ministers give to Scottish Water. This approach is promoted by the World Health Organisation and it has been embraced by many regulators throughout the world. Secondly, as a new provision also requires Scottish Water to identify drinking water abstraction points and monitor the quality of water at these points. This aligns with the requirements of the EU Water Framework Directive. The regulations also introduce new offences. It will be an offence for Scottish Water to supply drinking water which has not been disinfected and subject to adequate treatment or to supply drinking water from a treatment works in contravention of a requirement of a notice. The duty to treat water and disinfect is included in the regulations with the specific aim of the protection of public health and we believe that given the gravity of the duty, it is considered appropriate that it should be an offence for Scottish Water to supply any such water that has failed this duty. In addition to these new requirements, we have included a number of minor changes. For example, the standard for taste and odour was a specific quantitative value in the previous regulations. It now mirrors that of the directive, which is that the taste or odour of the water must be acceptable to consumers and that there must be no abnormal change. So to conclude, convener, a very high standard of drinking water quality is important for Scotland, not only for the health of the people living in Scotland, but also for the large number of visitors that are coming to Scotland each year. It is therefore important that we continue to ensure that the standard of water in Scotland is the best that it can be. And I would ask the committee to support these regulations and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions from the committee. Thank you. Yes, uh, Graham Day. Uh, thank you and welcome, uh, Minister. Just uh, two questions, really. Um, 
we're told that there's not anticipated to be a considerable financial impact because the number of such failures in any year is expected to be low. I just wonder what the basis for that assertion is, what the stats are, if you happen to have them, as to the number of breaches that have occurred previously. And also, just for the purposes of clarity, why the change, uh, the new requirement in Part 6, that it's Scottish water rather than local authorities that carry out this duty? In terms of the um, part six of these regulations, um, I mean, why we're changing the current regulations? I mean, certainly the Water Quality Scotland regulations, um, 2010, introduced a requirement for the investigation of a failure in a public building. Now, these regulations uh, were put in place specifically to address any infraction risks that there might be uh, if Scotland hadn't transposed uh, this specific requirement of the Drinking Water Directive when the original transposing regulations were made uh, back in 2001. And at the time the, um, the 2010 regulations were made, as the local authority uh, were given the power to take enforcement action against building owners, it was believed that the local authority should carry out uh, the investigation. Now, the practical implementation uh, of this requirement hasn't been uh, straightforward. Scottish Water must determine for any sample failure whether this failure is due to its supply at the point of entry to a building, regardless of whether this is a domestic or a commercial property. And it must therefore investigate this and, if necessary, uh, carry out inspections to ensure that any backflow uh, of contaminants into the public supply could not occur. Now, when failures in public buildings uh, have occurred uh, previously in the, well, in the past uh, three years, local authorities are often uh, reliant on Scottish Water to carry out an investigation. So we also we had a specific example of this was a serious contamination uh, incident back in 2012, and that involved um, antifreeze from an air conditioning uh, system entering the domestic distribution system at a laboratory. And in that example, the local authority didn't have the necessary um, expertise to investigate uh, that failure. So our policy is very much for Scottish Water to be required to investigate any such failure and to be able to recover its costs. Now, you asked about how many failures there have been. In 2013, uh, there were failures uh, in four public buildings. OK, thank you. That's useful. Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, and take this opportunity to welcome the Minister to her new uh, post and look forward to working with her constructively, of course, in the future. Uh, I was just wondering why the consultation was only six weeks, which doesn't seem too much of a time, and also just wonder how uh, robust uh, the memorandum is here, saying that there is uh, not any significant financial uh, effect is thought to uh, come from this new regulation. Well, the consultation itself, I mean, it generated uh, 11 responses, uh, including Scottish Water and eight of the local authorities. Um, there were no particular concerns that were raised during the consultation. Um, some of the points that were raised by Scottish Water uh, may be addressed uh, in guidance, and certainly the Scottish Government said it will consult with Scottish Water in preparing any such guidance. Uh, and there was, um, Scottish Water also agreed in the response that a business regulatory impact assessment uh, wasn't needed because there were no additional costs on businesses. That's fine, thanks. Are there any further questions just now? <coughs> there being no further questions, I thank uh, the Minister uh, wish to sum up. Um, no, I'm, no. I'm quite fine happy at the Right, so agenda <laughs> item five then is uh, the Public Water Supply Scotland Regulation 2014 draft, which we can debate up to 90 minutes, as you know, if you feel so inclined. <laughs> uh, hopefully not. We want to shorten the winter. That's the way to do it. Um, I invite the Minister to speak to and move the motion, the Public Water Supply Scotland Regulation 2014 draft. Minister. Uh, formally moved. Thank you. Invite uh, members who wish to make, make a comment or speak. No members do. Uh, wind up, Minister. I'm happy to waiver that. Thank you very much. Therefore, I put the question on the motion. That is, that the question is that motion S4M 11703 in the name of Aileen MacLeod be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Minister, and your official for that uh, 
brief uh, appearance. I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you in due course and look forward to that. Thank you Thank very, you very much. much, Convener. We'll have a brief suspension just now to change over witnesses. We shall move on now to agenda item 6, which is the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. The, this item uh, today is for the committee to take evidence from two separate panels of stakeholders on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. The first panel will focus on rural context of the bill and the second on the urban context and ECHR issues. And I, I welcome the panel today, John Hollingdale. Chief Executive of Community Woodlands uh, Association, um, Simon Fraser, Solicitor for Anderson St uh, MacArthur, Malcolm Coombe, uh, Lecturer in Law, School of Law in Aberdeen University, Rory Dutton, Development Officer for the Development Trust Association Scotland, and Sarah Jane Lang, uh, Director of Policy and Parliamentary Affairs for Scottish Land and Estates. Welcome to you all. And I refer members to the papers, and uh, we will open the questions with one from Graham Day. I thank you, Convener. Good morning. This is more a scene-setting question than anything. I just would like the views of the panel on whether they are satisfied about the extent of the dialogue and the consultation both on community right to buy and crofting community right to buy, and perhaps a view on whether it might have been more appropriate if the Part 4 provisions had been included in uh, separate land reform legislation. Uh, the microphones are obviously dealt with uh, centrally by uh, the control there, uh, so you don't need to switch them on and off. Just indicate to me and uh, I'll bring you in. Anyone want to kick off? Yes, uh, John. Yeah, I think in, in general we've been happy with the, there's been quite an extensive consultation process. Um, and I, you know, we've concentrated more on part three, um, part two rather than part two, the crofting community rights, but I haven't responded to that. In terms of which bit of the legislation goes in which bills, I think that was a question that was asked by several of us 
a year or two ago when it became apparent that there was this double stream. There was the Land Reform Review Group and Community Empowerment Bill, and we asked the question, would it be better there? And at that time, we didn't know that there was going to be this new Land Reform Bill coming up. So I think we were, at the time, we were happy that something was being done about some of the issues around community right to buy. And if Community Empowerment Bill was a, a vehicle to make that happen, then we were happy with the benefit of hindsight perhaps you could say it would all be better in the land reform bill but we didn't know that at the time <coughs> Simon Fraser <coughs> I think that uh, looking at it from the perspective of the Crofton community right to buy I would have to say I think the consultation was fine um, the obviously the, the the changes the suggested changes to uh, part three have come on along pretty late in the day um, and it, it is going to be essential to ensure that um, the enhanced community right to buy, which in a way mirrors the present Crofting community right to buy, is brought into line with whatever is done to the Crofting community right to buy as a consequence of the, of the, of the new measure. Malcolm. Thank you. In terms of the general consultation, the way there was the exploratory consultation and the follow-up consultation, I think there's been plenty of chance to get involved in the consultation exercise. In terms of the positioning of measures within something that might be headed land reform, you might even hark back to the 2003 Act when some people thought the access provisions in Part 1 of the Land Reform Act should not have been in that Act. It should have been a sort of access Act. But to a certain extent, as long as the law is on the statute book, if it's somewhere, that's fine. It would be optimal if it had a, a, a better, clearer title, but I think the way things have developed, as John has mentioned, you can, you can now see why it's ended up under this heading as opposed to land reform heading. Okay. Um, Sarah yeah, Jane. Just, yeah, I think we're uh, okay. uh, we go. happy with, it, with consultation. And as has been said earlier, um, you know, we were primarily interested in the, the other elements of the Community Empowerment Bill when it was in the early, early stages, and with this coming through, yeah, maybe with hindsight, it, 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 it could have been part of the, the broader land reform, but uh, you know, it, it's, we've certainly got no complaints uh, so far. Sarah Jane. I think on the Crofting Community Right to Buy, we've been more than happy with the consultation that's taking place across the country um, at the moment. Um, as Rory and others have said, the discussions of the Community Empowerment Bill have been lengthy and extensive. We probably would have liked more consultation on, on the definition of abandoned neglected land, which I'm sure we'll go in to talk about later. Um, on where it should be placed, I mean, I think we've all agreed that land reform is, is a process. Um, all land reform measures don't have to be in one bill. Land reform is affected by various pieces of legislation. Um, I, th I think it's just to ensure that people have clarity in what's happening. I think Simon referred to changes and how they impact on others. I, I do worry that if we have parallel pieces of legislation dealing with the same issue, we may get some confusion along the way. Uh, okay, I, think that's fine. I think I want to just sort of put this to you at this stage. Given the fact that uh, part three of the Crofting Community Right to Buy is almost a live issue uh, in terms of court proceedings and so on. It's important that the changes that take place in that, which we'll debate at stage two and investigate further, um, are dealt with before the amendments that are made to the uh, community right to buy, so that we're most up to date at that stage with what the regulations will say. Mm -hmm. So if things are dealt with in that order, it might answer your question, I think, Simon Fraser. We kind of agreed about that. So that's something to note, I think, for the future. OK. <coughs> um, policy memorandum, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you. Um, good morning, panel. It, it, this is, again, a bit of a sort of scene setter, really. Um, but in... Back in June, the convener of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee wrote to the Minister for Local Government and Planning, <coughs> expressing a few concerns about the information provided, if you like, in the policy memorandum itself, and in fact described it as little more than a superficial overview, which is, is quite, um, quite a criticism in some ways. <coughs> and a bit of correspondence went back and forward, and a few things were clarified. But at the end of the day, the policy memorandum actually <coughs> devotes less than three pages to the whole of part four of the bill, and at one point um, summarises 20 sections of the bill uh, in a mere seven bullet points. And my question is really quite simple. 
um, which is, do, do you feel, or, or maybe to simplify this, does anybody not feel that they were provided with um, enough information to fully explain the aims and policy choices uh, and provisions within the bill? Um, or are you satisfied that, that there was enough information provided? Sarah Jane. Um, as a stakeholder community um, empowerment bill stakeholder, I did feel that we, we got quite a lot of information. I don't think that was fully reflected within the policy memorandum. I think that the Scottish Government did a great job in trying to um, develop the Plain English Guide, which I think was very useful. I, I'm not sure that we have had enough um, convener and that uh, information, and I think I've come to that conclusion having discussed elements of this, this bill, because we've got different people thinking the excuse me, same provisions mean different things. And if you have that, it means that somewhere along the line, the explanation, either the explanatory notes or the policy memorandum, um, aren't providing enough information on what we're trying to deliver. John? Yeah, I think at a kind of policy level, particularly for those who are, who kind of were involved in this on a regular basis, then, then we all understood what was meant and probably what was intended. What was missing, and I think probably we'll pick up on this later, is how certain specific provisions in in the bill as introduced actually were expected to deliver the outcomes in, in the policy memorandum. And uh, so at that kind of line by line basis, there's some gaps. You want to achieve this, but you're saying this, and that doesn't appear to work for us. And Malcolm? Yeah, I, I generally think, well, I, I probably start from a slightly different position than most in that I'm really interested in this kind of thing. Uh, and, and I engage with legislation quite regularly. And I, I didn't find it too problematic but I appreciate my starting point is maybe a little bit different to some. So I, I thought there was, there was a fair amount of explanation to allow me to understand it. Okay. Um, Alec Ferguson, any? No, I think by the sound of it, you know, we, we, yeah. any of these differences may come out in further discussion, so I I'm think they will. happy to leave it just now. Thank you very much. So the financial memorandum, Jim Hume. Good morning to the panel. Uh, yes, just regarding uh, the financial implications, the, the memorandum actually states it doesn't anticipate that there will be any uh, sig significant additional costs, costs on the Scottish Government regarding this legislation, but it does go on to state that there is a large degree of uncertainty on the level of costs regarding communities and uh, landowners. So just be interested in the panel's views on what costs they uh, anticipate will come from the legislation uh, for rural communities and landowners and also for public bodies. Who's first? Rory Dutton. Uh, just, just, uh, just to make the point that uh, to see it in the wider context of community empowerment bill, I think you can't just look at the cost of this measure alone because if you are to have significant things happening in community empowerment and uh, uh, greater transfers of assets and, and land ownership, then it does need a greater support for the likes of these community anchor organisations, um, you know, capacity building, uh, support training, uh, financial support for them. So I've, j I've just made the point that you, know, you, can't, you can't just look at this, the impl financial implications of this bill in isolation as it is part of the wider community empowerment agenda. Okay. Sarah, Jane. I think many of the provisions are demand-driven, and I think that's one thing where it's very hard to actually gauge what the costs will be for the Scottish Government, especially if they're to take on the costs of running ballots and, and, and other elements of this. Um, we don't know what the demand will be across Scotland for, um, for the use of these provisions, um, especially if they're extended to, to urban Scotland. So um, I think it's, it's actually a very, very hard financial memorandum to, um, to pinpoint the exact costs. Look at some of the actual costs. It would come out as a legal cost, as it costs of um, setting up plans and just the actual specific costs that would be quite useful for us to know. My, uh, Simon. Well, in general, those costs falling on the community, if I can look at it from that, that, that end, uh, tend to be met, <coughs> if not um, from public funds, then from lottery and that sort of thing. There may be a bit of pump priming from HIE in the earlier stages, not a vast amount. But there, there, there's an inevitability that there will be a, a cost which will have to be met because the average community is seeking to take on a project of this nature will not necessarily have the funds to take it forward themselves, even, the, even in the initial stages. Um, in the past, HIE were able to assist quite substantially, uh, and that seems to have... In, in the main been moved into the Scottish Land Fund uh, 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 purse, but 
there will be a causal required to be met from some source. John Hollingdale? <coughs> and, uh, I think the, the biggest f cost, overwhelmingly, is the, the acquisition of assets at the end of the process. And if we have a... So if, let's say, we have a Scottish land fund of £10 million a year, then there's £10 million a year of government money at the moment going towards acquisition. But there's no way of... And I'm sure that would get spent. But it's very difficult to predict what proportion of those acquisitions would be coming through these provisions. So even if there was no community right to buy or it just didn't work at all, it's still quite likely that there will be £10 million worth of, ac of community acquisitions coming through the National Forest Land Scheme or local authority asset transfers or, or private sales. So picking out the impact of this bit, the community right to buy purchases so far have been a relatively small proportion of the overall big picture. So I think that's a very difficult one to get a, a clear number for. The other one... The other direct costs are those of the Scottish government's, whichever branch of the Scottish government ends up administering this and running that, and that's some ongoing staff costs and then ballot costs and so on. But even if you had 100 ballots a year at three or four or five thousand pounds a year, which seems highly unlikely to me, that's still only the cost of one acquisition of 100 hectares or, or whatever. So. Those, those costs seem to be relatively small to me, but again, very demand-driven, difficult to pick out exactly where they come. And just to follow on that, I, mean, I think we're starting to hint at it. It's obviously difficult to look into a crystal ball, but we have to try to think uh, we'll, we'll actually need additional support uh, for applications, if, especially if there's a, a, an increase, generally speaking, and in what form, if that is thought... Yes, possibly. I mean, I think both, certainly both Rory and I work for organisations that, that do that support for our members. And if, as a result, the floodgates open, then, then we would be swamped by demand. Actually, I don't think that's all that likely to happen. We would expect a kind of gradual increase in um, demand, and we might need some help to do that. But I don't think it's a vast <coughs> task, and I don't think it's a, it's a you know extra vast task for high or whoever within government is supporting and administering these mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm schemes. Malcolm yeah. Some of the support is already... In terms of if a community previously had to incorporate as a company limited does by guarantee, they had to do that already in the 2003 Act scheme, so the existing sources can be looked to. It's just a case of giving the exi whatever support might be there, beefing that up a little bit. And in terms of anything else, in um, an analogy might be the sort of recent introduction of the crofting register in terms of that's obviously going to introduce some element of administration cost but to coin a phrase you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs if the if the if the policy goal is there there will be costs somewhere but that's something to be to be met Convener, good, good morning to the panel. It, it's a, a quick supplementary, I think, but um, one or two panel members have mentioned high, and I just wonder about uh, the support beyond um, the highlands and islands in relation to um, communities and costs specifically, uh, especially in view of the fact that although the Land Reform um, Review Group has, has made recommendations, as we all know, about the, the different bodies that might be set up in government, but that's not necessarily... Well, it's going to happen even in spite of the announcements about the consultation, you know, not to preempt empt the, the, the new land reform bill. So I'm just wondering if there are any comments on support beyond the highlands for communities. Rory Dunn. And the Scottish Government is funding the Strength of Communities programme, which uh, we, we're helping deliver in partnership uh, for... It's only a relatively small number out with the higher, I think it's about 25 groups, and they're already the established groups. So if you like, that sort of capacity building um, is very welcome and we'd like to see that rolled out more broadly. Um, there's also small grant schemes, you know, like investing in ideas and things like that from the lottery that people can get assistance for. But I would, I would probably concur that where there's an opportunity and there isn't an established group, there, there is a deficit there of, of support. Um, for getting an organisation up and running to then be able to then take advantage of this because it is quite a lengthy process. Okay, that's fine on that point. Um, uh, John Hollingdale, perhaps? There's a slight distinction between support in terms of 
helpful folk who kind of talk you through it. And to some extent, that's less of an issue because there are organisations like our own and, and DTAS who, who do that across Scotland. And if there is less of that coming outside the high area, then that's less of a problem. The big issue, I think, is that high has also been able to financially support the development of community groups in a way that Scottish enterprise hasn't, or that hasn't happened in the Scottish enterprise area. And that's obviously a gap that us and DTAS aren't in any position to fill. I mean, that's, I think, something that's been a long-standing issue of debate is whether Scottish enterprise or whatever body works outside the high area. There should be someone with some sort of strengthening communities remit, but that's not yet. Yes, that is a long-standing issue, which mm. has been raised in committee after committee about what Scottish Enterprise does in that respect. We'll take that on board. Um, move on to uh, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 and removal of land-based barriers. Um, Cara Hilton. Um, thank you for being Good morning, panel. Um, given that the objective of the 2003 Act was to remove land-based barriers to the sustainable development of rural communities, I'd like to ask the panel... Um, how well you think that has worked in practice and how has rural Scotland changed as a result and um, I refer to the written submissions and note the Community Woodlands Association have said um, that the complexities and hurdles contained within the Act have severely limited its use on the ground. Would the panel agree with that position? You're going to start, John. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, I think... It's clear that the numbers of successful acquisitions through the Act are pretty low. I think about 16 or so in 10 years, which doesn't seem a huge um, positive track record. There are obviously, it has a wider symbolic influence than that. But the existence of the Act sets a, a framework, and there have been other tran um, transfers to community ownership that have happened kind of because of the Act being there and it was easier to just negotiate a, a settlement. So I think in that respect it's had a, a very positive effect. It's probably fair to say though that it, the rate of change, there wasn't a sort of step change in the rate of community ownership. I, roughly looking through a membership of 150 or so organisations, the median age is about 2002-2003. So, in other words, half of them were around before the Act. And if you think about a lot of the big iconic buyouts, they, they predate the Act. So it didn't completely change the practical delivery of community ownership or the practical extent of community ownership in, in an enormously radical way. It has definitely helped, but perhaps not to the extent that we had hoped it would. Malcolm Cook. I echo a lot of what John has said there. I echo a lot of what John has said. Um, what I would say is, having checked yesterday what the Register of Community and Land had in terms of its registrations, it's currently got 175 registered interests, not all of which have been... Some of them are deleted, some of them have... Sort of, a few have been activated. 40 of those um, relate to Fife. There was a lot of registrations along King Ho around Kinghorn Loch because there was individual ownership. So you can actually discount a few in terms of how many of those are actual one one application, or, or rather five applications, might be one community, if you know what I mean. Um, so um, th that, as John has said, has maybe not had a, a marked effect since 2003. So symbolically, it, it has something, but bureaucratically, in terms of how how many actual changes have been affected. Um, for example, there was the, the bottling factory in Lachwanach, the old crystal clear factory. There had been a, a lot of attempts to take that on and that kind of burnt out and nothing really happened. So whether or not the 2003 Act has been effective in that particular instance, it may be not, but overall, it's a more difficult question. Rory Dutton. Yeah, um, I, 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 back what John was saying there about the... The fact this is in the background, even if some things don't appear on here, uh, on in the stats. If, for example, local authorities are aware that a community might put a, a community right to buy a registration on a on a on a, on a property if, if, if things don't start moving. Um, but I'd say that yes, there, there are low low absolute numbers, and you know the bottom line is it's it's not a right to buy. It's been a, it's been a right of preemption if it comes on the market, and you know, and and tied to that, that is a. 
you know, your, your registration expires after five years. Um, it's quite onerous uh, for, for volunteer organisations to go through the registration process. Can they, can they go, uh, face doing that again after five years? So, you know, I, I think the bottom line to me is, is that it's a, it's, a, it's a right of preemption and a lot of assets that communities would be interested in um, don't come up on the market. Okay, Sarah Jane. I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said so far. Um, I, I think, as John said, the uh, transfers which have happened be through the Act are, are only one part. Um, but I think everyone would agree that the Act itself has probably not delivered um, the aspirations of many at the time it was introduced. Go on. Thank you. Just a wee supplementary to that. Um, I would just be interested in, on your views and how you think the experiences to date have informed the Community Empowerment Bill as it's currently drafted. Sarah Jane. I think um, one of the things that has come through in the Community Empowerment Bill is that ownership is, is only one aspect of, of empowering communities, understanding how community planning works, what a community's needs are, um, whether ownership will actually meet that need. The, the Community Empowerment Bill takes all those things into consideration and starts to try and look at community ownership in, in the round of an effective um, local decision-making and community planning um, framework. I don't think it actually goes far enough but I do think it, it is a start. So I, I think a lot of those things came out, a lot of the problems about relationships, communication, other barriers to development, all came out, are all drawn out because of problems people were experiencing with the 2003 Act, and they have been recognised in this new bill. It doesn't go far enough. Yeah. No. Explain. Um, I think when it comes to community planning and local decision-making, um, you can't legislate for all of that. Um, I would like to see something in here in the bill about um, community councils, their role, um, about how communities really do play an effective part in local decision making um, by local authorities and other agencies. And the community planning for me still feels like the same agencies round the table. It doesn't feel like um, bottom up involving communities of geography and communities of interest. Um, so we. We've made these comments to the Local Government Regeneration Committee um, about the parts and community planning, but I think especially from a rural point of view, um, the framework within which community ownership sits is actually very important, which means that we have to have the community planning um, partnerships working effectively. Indeed. Um, first of all, John, and then Rody. I'd agree with Sarah Jane that ownership is not the only means for communities to achieve their objectives, and I think ha having the community right to buy within the broader community empowerment bill is in a useful recognition of that because there are lots of other bits that that support community aspirations without ownership elsewhere in the bill but as far as the specific amendments to part two of the land reform act i think there is a lot of positive amendments in there but i think at some level they're a bit cosmetic rather than addressing some of the structural problems with the bill. So they will undoubtedly smooth the process and, and ease matters, but it's a bit like you know, this model of car is not very good, but now it will have airbags and, and a catalytic converter, but it still only has one gear and petrol's rationed. It isn't going to go very much better. And I think that's a, that's a bit of a, an issue to my mind that it hasn't addressed some of the fundamental structural problems with the way that part two works or doesn't work. Um, well, one, so the good things are things like allowing SKIOs to be members. But fundamentally, if your community body is a SKIO or a company limited by guarantee, it doesn't change the fact that you have to go through this registration process and then sit there for five years, re-register, sit there endlessly until the landowner decides to sell if they ever decide to sell. Um, so that fundamental issues about whether you actually need a registration process, this kind of two-step process that's very much at the whim of the seller, I think are, are bigger issues than what form of community body is it that's sitting there waiting. A bit more detail yeah. about uh, registration and so on. And I'd, I'd make the point about the registrations. I think I also looked at the register the other week just to get the up-to-date stats, and I think there's 175 also registrations listed of which 124 are deleted that's 124 registration processes that have where communities and not they're not all separate 124 communities because as we said sometimes there are multiple registrations from a single community 
but that's 124 out of 175 instances where the community has done a huge amount of work because um, it's not an easy process to get to that stage and it hasn't happened, it hasn't worked. And then there's 30 or so that are sort of sitting there waiting for the land to come up and 16 where it's gone through. So that suggests to me that there's a kind of structural issue that communities aren't really, the majority of communities aren't being able to progress through the scheme. Did you want to come in at this stage, Dave Thompson, at all? Um, well, it was an issue I was going to uh, pick up on uh, generally uh, convene. I mean, I, I'm happy to deal with it just now if, if you if Well, you since like. we're talking about registration. Ah, OK. An idea. Um, yeah, good morning uh, to, the, to the panel. Um, yes, I'm interested in... in whether sh there should be, you know, the panel's views on whether there, there should be a need to um, pre-register at all, because a lot of the evidence we've had so far indicates that a great number of registrations have been late, in inverted commas, registrations and so on, and obviously communities, you know, the amount of work they have to do to, to, to register an interest. And they've got to try and anticipate what's in the minds of um, the landowners, which is basically impossible to do. And, and how is a community going to know if a particular piece of land that's been in, in, in one ownership for hundreds of years, uh, um, there's no indication whatsoever it's likely to come up, and then all of a sudden it comes up. Why would a community register an interest in property like that, you know, that has never been in the market uh, for a long, a long time? So I just really wonder whether we shouldn't be simplifying the process and allowing communities, just as the norm, uh, not requiring uh, pre-registration, uh, early registration at all, so you wouldn't need to re-register, and if we're going to have to re-register, then five years certainly seems a very short time. You know, it should maybe be uh, extended. And it should be a much simpler process to re-register. You should just be able to say, I want to re-register or something pretty simple. So I'd, I'd like to get your views on this because I'm, I'm just, I just wonder whether there should be any need at all to register early. Rory Dutton, start. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I would agree that this definitely needs a good look, because um, that is, I mean, people use you know, the word scanner or whatever. It is, a, it is a big job to register in the first place. Some people give up at that stage because of the, um, uh, the process involved. And yes, I mean, five years soon passes, and you have to think about re-registering. So yes, it would be great to extend it to 10 years or whatever, um, or to, to look at options to do away with it. I mean, I, I don't have the stats as to how many are actually late registrations, but a lot of the ones that we get involved in speaking to people about, um, because as you say, they can't anticipate um, what um, land's going to come up. There are probably several different assets that could make a key difference to their community. Do, do they put a um, interest, register of interest in them all, just in case any of them come up? Um, perhaps there's um, several different ownerships involved. Um, so I, I would, I would, a greater emphasis on, on what, what are now called late applications. Um, which would certainly help, and the, the option of doing away with the pre-registration, I can see why why it's there, but, um, but I, I think that's definitely worth worth exploring. Yeah, John. I mean, my understanding is that the idea of having pre-registration is because is that you want to encourage communities to be proactive, and I think we agree that proactive thinking ahead is better generally than, than simply being reactive to, to opportunity. But having encouraged communities to be proactive and place these registrations, then there's no kind of reward for that. And as you say, when, once you get past the individual iconic site, you know, the lighthouse or the, the disused military base, which the vast majority of communities don't have anyway, it becomes a much more kind of generic process. I, if I was designing the thing from scratch, I think the way to do the system is to have encourage communities, however you structure and define them, whether it's through community anchor organisations and so on, to do some sort of community development planning and identify um, the sort of land building assets that they need to deliver the things that, they, that their community wants, whether that's a piece of land for allotments, for affordable housing, for a children's play park, for a community woodland and be in the position where they have specified if we need land for affordable housing, then there's clearly certain types of land would fit that specification and other bits, you know, the thousand hectares out on the, 
the more isn't useful. But you have, you have a kind of specification laid down. <laughs> then when land comes on the market, um, then they have a point to, to preempt or the possibility to preempt if that land fits their previously announced specification. Um, in France, they have a system, I'm not going to give you the French name, you'll be pleased to hear, but essentially land development and rural settlement associations that just have a standard preemption on land when it comes up the market. So everybody selling land in, I believe it's rural France, and I don't quite know where they draw the line for rural France, but these organisations, which are, I think, the 20 or so run on a regional basis, decide whether, the, you know, whether they want to preempt, to buy in and then sell on if it's in the public interest. And I don't know whether they frame exactly as public interest and sustainable development, but essentially for those purposes, for the good of the community, they will buy and then sell to the local farmer or whatever. So and I, I don't see why we couldn't have a similar system here where there was kind of an automatic right of preemption that at least someone had a look and said, does this fit with an existing community development plan? If it does, then we give the community the option. If not, go on with the, with the open market sale. That clearly doesn't breach European human rights rules. Otherwise, it wouldn't have run like that for 40 years in France, I imagine. But it makes so. a difference when you've got local government and not regional government yes. to actually focus. It, on yes, the there's a whole different structural differences. But I mean, I think in terms of the principle of the way you can operate, that would be workable. To Malcolm Coombe. Yeah, we've got three points to make. In, in terms of the purpose of registration, one's been alluded to, and it, it sort of focuses the community and sig singles out an asset and programmes what they're going to do. The second role of registration is publicity for the landowner. The landowner has a legitimate expectation that they should know what's happening to their land and so on, and registration puts them on notice that a community is interested, and that's fine. Um, publicity, though, to a certain extent, that could be achieved in another way, and the, the, the immediate comparison, well, there was a comparison with France just made by John. Within Scotland, you could look at the Part 3 Crofton community right to buy. There is no need to register with regard to that because the publicity relates to the fact the, law, the land is under Crofton tenure, part of the common grazings, or certainly eligible additional land. Now, it's a policy question as to whether or not an owner of rural land should just be on notice that any land that they own could be susceptible to a right of preemption or whatever right that may be. So, so yes, yeah, so, so doing away with registration, it, it, it would sort of, it would do away with the, the focal point in terms of getting community mobilised and may do away with some publicity aspects, but that's not necessarily in and of itself a bad thing. There are other models there. Coming back to the late applications point, um, the, the main, the, the first big bit of litigation about part two was uh, to do with Home Hill down near Dunblane, um, where a community, at, basically when they saw the for sale signs, realised that this hotel development was suddenly available and they tried to go through the Section 39 late application route and that's get bigger hurdles in terms of sustainable development tests and being definitely in the public interest. You've had that. Yeah. So, so I, will, I will gloss over that, but obviously they will... They, they will have told you more than I will. Um, and in terms of the third point I was going to make was the five-yearly renewal. Um, having a sort of from-scratch five-yearly renewal is probably quite an unnecessary administrative burden. Um, a quick, do you still want to have a registered interest? Yes, I do. So assuming, assuming the register was to stay, it could be a lot simpler. And, and a, the renewal process would be part of that. A fast-track system would certainly help. Okay, um, Sarah Jane. Just, just to echo what John said, the driver for the registration should be the community needs. The, um, whether the landowner is likely to bring that land onto the market at any time in the future shouldn't be irrelevant, but that should be the secondary driver. Um, and I think it's the same. We've talked about this about rural housing and r rural, rural buses, and you don't stand, up, just stand in the road if there's no buses coming along. But that doesn't mean that there's not a need for that bus to, to go past. And I think it's the same with, um, with registering an interest. You're showing your... Um, 
you're indicating as a community that you have a need which you feel will be met by that piece of land. Um, and, and I think that's quite a positive step. Malcolm used the phrase, um, the, the owner's on notice. I actually think in some cases it's, it's been the first um, step in, in dialogue with, with owners, which has often led to um, asset transfers out with the, the terms of the, of the Act. Um, I agree uh, with Malcolm also that we're going to look at re-registration, then, then there's no reason why it can't be simplified. There's a couple of supplementaries. Can I just come back on yeah, this convener? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand what, what's being said, but the, the Home Hill one, that, that was very interesting in the sense that it was a, a public area to all intents and purposes. The, the local people thought it was public and they'd used it for decades or more. Why would they ever think they would have to register an interest in something they thought was theirs anyway? You know, now, OK, legally it, it wasn't, but, uh, uh, you know, it caused them problems. And the evidence we got last week was that, you know, these, these conditions about late application and all the rest, it made it virtually impossible for them to, to actually get in there and do anything about it. So there's, there are obviously serious uh, problems and issues. Can I maybe just um, look at the... Um, the registration, it, convenient, it was about the good reasons and what's replacing it, yeah. or would you rather take um, supplementaries well, if they're Well, if it's supplementaries on the bits we've yeah. had, you could come on to that in yeah. a minute okay. or two, would you? Yeah, OK. Ah. Alec Ferguson and then uh, Graham Day. Um, th th thank you, convener. I, I will be as brief as possible, but actually, because Sarah Jane Lang has just put, I think, much more eloquently than I would have done, some of the point I was going to make, which is that I, I, I personally am inclined to the view that some sort of process is necessary, albeit a simplified one, I'm, I'm very open to that argument, particularly when it comes to re-registration. But I, I do feel that a, a process of some sort um, helps to underline both a commitment by the community involved uh, and it sort of, you know, strengthen that commitment and also um, alert the, the landowner involved or, or the owner of, of the possibilities that might exist through a, a possible right to buy. But I, I wanted to pick up a point that I, I think it was John Hollingdale made, I think, which I think you used the phrase, having gone through the process, you then have to hang around and wait for the land to come on the market, or words to that effect, and forgive me if I put words in your mouth. Um, I, 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 I'd just be interested to know what your answer to that is, because it seems to me that if you aren't, if, if you aren't going to hang around and wait for the market, the, the, the land to come on the market, you are talking about a, a, an absolute right to buy as opposed to a preemptive one. And I, I wonder if you could expand on your... Is that what you're advocating? Just before you do, a supplementary to the supplementary. Uh, th thank you, Kavira, because it, it just very much fits in with Alec Ferguson's point. I think go back to the comment that Malcolm Coombe made, where I think you, you talked about instead of having a five-year full re-registration process, you would simply go back and say, do you still have an interest? Well, of course, you may be a different entity because I presently have a planning application in my constituency, which, if it's granted, would see a community's housing footprint increased from 100 homes to 300 homes within a four to five year period. So the nature of that community could fundamentally change. Right. So those two points, John. Um, so to <laughs> your point first, Mr. Ferguson. I mean, yes, yeah, so I think, firstly, we. we do agree in principle that there should be the kind of absolute right to buy, but I suspect we'll talk about those, the part 3A bits earlier. I think my concern is more with why it is that communities don't use the part 2 registration process and don't use it as, po as part of proactive planning is that, as you say, as it's constructed you have no mechanism to kind of make anything happen once you've achieved your registration. So if your landowner suddenly becomes aware that there are community interests and aspirations, then they can either say, let's go through the, the process, and that's happened with a few of the landowners where the right to buy has worked, or they can say, well, let's come to a negotiated settlement. But if they aren't interested, then there is nothing you can do. And I think the reality of community bodies is that they're set up to do a whole range of things and deliver community aspirations and they'll choose the routes that appear to achieve things for them. So a community body isn't going to sit there with um, existing registrations and nothing happen. It'll focus its attention 
you wouldn't you wouldn't say if we've got five ways to try and achieve some of the things the multiple things that communities want to to do because very few communities come up with a kind of single issue those community bodies go and focus on the things that look achievable and um, you know we know how to do that we can go to the lottery we can get a grant we can do whatever the ones that have gone into the registration process and have gone through it tend to be those where there's a kind of single iconic standalone um, project that is an obvious thing to fix I mean I think the, the two lighthouses have gone through the, the process military bases things where there is a one-off in that particular community and it's there's been enough value for that single site for the community to to put the registration in what they haven't done is used it generally speaking to do the kind of run-of-the-mill development processes things that affordable housing allotments so on you either try and achieve them other ways or you give up and say we'll do it when we find you know when the opportunity arises um, it's actually very difficult with the act of the way it's structured at the moment to place multiple if if you want affordable housing in your small town there might actually be 20 30 40 gap sites available um, you have no idea which one would come up first do you register all of them that's right multiple things so my suggestion in that case is it's much more sensible to have a system where the community that wants affordable housing or, or allotments or whatever it is is in a position to say we would like to have a right of preemption on any piece of appropriate land that comes up in their community and then pick the first one that comes up and it might well be as a part of that process that one of those landowners steps forward and says actually yeah you know what this bit I've got here would work and and you don't have to go through the process at all and that, so that's my way of trying to do it is broadening the scope of how communities use the act I think if they can do it any bit that fits and obviously that has, someone has to kind of run the rule over that but essentially any bit that fits would be a much better way than specifying and having to go through the process with each separate landowner and for with a very uncertain outcome We'll put that to the urban panel that comes next as yeah. well. <coughs> um, Simon Fraser first. Yes, I thought I would make a general comment. Yeah. I'm, I'm not part, no particular ex expertise about part two, but as a general comment, I was involved uh, professionally in the acquisition of a number of large uh, holdings, particularly prior to 2003, I would have to say. Um, and I would also have to say that the 2003 Act provisions would have assisted not one of them in fact, would probably have acted as a, a major barrier to progress in every single one of them. Um, I can well understand how part two may be of assistance if you want to acquire the odd surplus lighthouse or something like that. But if your whole estate that your whole community live on suddenly comes in the market, uh, the current provisions are practically useless, being able to intervene at the level and the scale and the time required uh, to do so. A community may not realise that they're whole estate is going to come in the market, their whole personal world is going to come in the market. They may have an aspiration to acquire something, but when the whole thing comes in the market, that's an entirely different ballgame. And it's certainly my view that the, the, the Act, as it stands at present, would, would, would avail them nothing whatsoever. Malcolm Coop. After that rise, rather seismic comment from Simon, I'm going to go to matters more mundane. Um, in terms of who is you, um, who, if you uh, do you still have an interest? The question would be who is you now. To a certain extent, that's answered by it's a it's an immortal body that's been set up a company limited by guarantee. The office holders might have changed, but the you is that company limited by guarantee. And in that regard, registration focuses who the you is. So, so, so if you moved away from a situation that you did not have registration, you might have different questions as to how to identify the community if they hadn't had that pre-step. But the other thing to very quickly mention is, in the scheme at present, there is provision for overlapping registrations, and that has actually come up in Ascent previously. So it is possible that, that there are two use um, and it's then for Scottish ministers to decide which one to 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 go for so it's a, it's a shrewd question who is you but I, I think it can be answered 
hopefully. If I could make one other quick point in response to Alex Ferguson's point about putting the landowner on notice, I, I agree. Um, in terms of, I, I, I think it, it can be, it can be a good thing to sort of signal a sign. But at the same time, I am aware of some communities that have been in dialogue, and they regard the idea that registering an interest might be seen as inflammatory, in terms of if they if they were to register an interest, shoot, that, that, that would sort of lock the landowner into a process that might not be as good as a consensus-driven based approach. Now, that's not to say, uh, obviously, it's just two things in a dialectic. There's, there's one thing that could be a good thing, one thing could be a bad thing in terms of the registration process. Um, so, so I just want to put that counterpoint there that some people do regard the idea that it might sort of change the dynamic of what could have been a consensual negotiation to suddenly make it go a bit more legal if people know there is that or not. So I, I'm not sure there's an answer to that. I'm just mentioning that there's a counterpoint there. So Sarah Jane and then Rory. Yeah. Um, possibly a very quick and simple response to Graham's um, question about, about changing circumstances. I think you just need to ask at point of re-registration, have there been material changes? Um, I, I, and if it's yes, you go down one route. If it's no, you go down an another route. And I, I don't think that there'd be any problems in having that sort of dual process for re-registration. Because you're right, Graham. I mean, you know, a, a, cha a material change such as a huge swell within the community, which could have different views and, and, and different needs, does have to be taken into consideration. But you ca could have a dual registration process. Just to pick up on, on, on Ma what Malcolm and I think John said as well, I, I feel like I'm banging on about community planning, but I think a lot of this is about that. Where a uh, registration has happened and it is viewed as inflammatory is often where there's, there's no community planning process, there's no dialogue, there's no engagement. So it does feel a little bit like, uh, you know, we want that of you, but, but the reality is there's never been any discussions about what that is, what it be used for, um, would you actually consider giving us in the, in the first place? And it, it then becomes quite adversarial. Um, we had suggested, I, th I think, in our submission convener that rather than looking at, at preemption, proactivity on the, part, on the part of the landowner, I think, is something that all of us feel that there's a need for greater proactivity by landowners in engaging with the communities. Um, we had suggested uh, as well that there might be a requirement for notice from a landowner to an established community body. Um, prior to any sale, which would mean that you got notice before it went on the market, so you wouldn't just know when you drove down the road and saw the estate for sale signs. I, I, I feel, again, that puts the onus very much on the engagement and, and, and a positive relationship uh, basis, rather than that right of preemption, which always feels adversarial. OK. Rory, thank you. <coughs> um, quite a lot of balls in here just now, but for, I'll just make a, a point, just to bear in mind at all times that in a lot of cases, we are dealing with volunteers here, and uh, it, is a, it is a huge demand on volunteers. And going through this process, people get burned out. Um, Organisations lose their steam um, if, if the, for example, the assets withdrawn from the market at the last minute. It has a devastating impact on the morale of that community. So we are talking about volunteer time, and we are talking about um, you know, a, a very precious vo um, human resources go into these that can easily be um, wasted, if you like. But I go, go back to the earlier point about um, has this bill kind of addressed the main issues and will it result in any sort of transformational change? Obviously, we're talking later on about the urban one, that's something that could well make a big difference. And the, the other point I would make, you know, while there has been lots of um, proposals there for easing the process, the other big one would be the abandoned neglected land because that's a right, of, right to buy rather than a preemption right. Now, we would like to see... Um, in the interest of efficient use of, of um, community volunteer time, if there was a way, whether it's done through a more of a planning route or whether it's done through um, um, an absolute kind of r r right to buy, you know, more on a sustainable development basis than on um, you know, abandoned, neglected land, then that would be a far more um, effective use of what is a very scarce and precious resource in these communities uh, to, to try uh, to, to make things happen and to move these communities forward. We will discuss abandoned and uh, neglected yeah. quite soon, as you can imagine. Um, continuing with registration, Dave Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, that's all very interesting. Um, and, and it strikes me that a much simplified registration process, possibly involving some kind of general registration for a purpose, 
rather than identifying a piece of land. I think it was mentioned by John. So that a community might have a purpose in terms of creating more general community land or housing land or whatever, and they could put in a general interest in any land coming up for, you know, that they could use for that purpose might be one way forward. They could do that early, or they could possibly do it once a piece of land does come up, you know, what, what's called late registrations until now. I was also interested in the comment about um, communities being devastated once they go through a process and then land is withdrawn. Maybe we should be looking at um, something which says once the land has gone on the market and once the community have shown an interest, the land can't be withdrawn. So I'd be interested to know if that is something because that would prevent a landowner uh, putting it uh, on the market and then to usurp the community, withdrawing it again. Now, around all of that, sorry if I'm going on quite a lot here, there's a lot, a lot of issues in here. The, the good reasons um, issue has been withdrawn. Uh, it, it's not in the, the bill in terms of late registrations. And as I say, I'm not keen on this early, late and all that. I think we should have registration and, and, and different people be able to come in at different times potentially. But the new clauses that are in the bill in terms of late registration, we had some evidence from Community Land Scotland saying that uh, you know it's to do with such relevant work as ministers consider reasonable was carried out and just how that would be interpreted. I just wonder again how, what the panel thinks about how easy it would be for a community to prove that they had undertaken earlier work, you know, because it's got to be done sufficiently in advance. So again, coming back to this point about why do we need to have early registration? Why not just have a registration along the lines that I've uh, mentioned a few minutes ago? John? Yeah, I mean, I think in her evidence, that was one of the, precisely that point. But it's very unclear to us what the, the phrasing or what the interpretation of such relevant work as the ministers decide it says the relevant work was carried out in respect of land with a view to the land being used for purposes that are the same as those proposed to the land if that I guess there is an interpretation of that that's possible that is precisely that, that the community has defined that it wants to register land for specific purposes or it has identified specific purposes for which it wishes to acquire land and if minister and then once a bit of land comes on the market that fits this specification that would be fit for those purposes, if it's understood that ministers then accept that that meets this test, then I think we'd be very happy with that. But it's not clear to us that it does, and I'm not quite sure exactly what the phrasing is on the face of the bill or indeed in the, in the kind of guidance behind it that, that locks that in. But that, there's certainly a possibility that that might happen, but it's not quite clear to us that that's exactly what they were thinking of, the, you know, the bill team were thinking of when they wrote those lines. We'll reflect on that, for sure. Um, can we move on to another point now? I don't think there's any more that we need to say on, uh, on this matter. No one else wanted to come in there? That's fine. Um, Claudia Beamish, the meaning of community. Uh, the complex issue of the meaning of community, which has been touched on by yourself, John, in relation to skios, and uh, it's very much in the air, this definition that, um, and I'm not going to go into the detail of the Section 34 of the 2003 Act, which panel members will be familiar with, although I'm happy to cover it if, if we need to um, do my best anyway. <laughs> um, it, it's obviously very important, uh, looking at this, this bill, uh, to consider in what ways the definition of community uh, can be widened. And I'm, I'm interested to know what the views of the panel are um, uh, beyond yourself, John, and, uh, on SKIOs. And also last week it was mentioned um, by the Development um, Trust Association Scotland about um, ben, the BENCOM structure and a question mark over why that was excluded. Um, there's also the issue to cover the, the main points, and then we can have the, the discussion. I hope this is useful. Also issues around whether postcode units are too restrictive um, and a way to define rural communities, if not through postcode. 
uh, communities of interest, such as arts organisations, or um, I saw something um, came into me earlier in, in the week about um, sports organisations as well, um, such as golf courses. Um, there are charities, ethnic groups. Um, so there are definitions in relation to communities of interest that could be considered. There are also, of course, um, as, we're, as was referred to in last week's panel, co um, communities of, of place. Um, so I'm really just opening that up for mem members of the panel to comment on as they see appropriate. That would be very helpful. Rory Dutton. Thank you. Um, uh, just to confirm, just, we, were, we were asking why in our submission that if SCIOs are coming on board, um, why not also community benefit societies, particularly given the resurgence in interest in them currently due to the, um, the, um, the way of raising finance through uh, community share issues. And we've recently had lottery funding uh, ordered to consortium for promoting that and, uh, option. So we, 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 I, I understand um, that you know, the ministerial, there may be ministerial regulation which can extend it beyond SKUs and companies limited by guarantee, but we say, well, why not just include community benefit societies from the outset? The other point is, indeed, do you have to go and specify specific legal structures? Why not just specify the, the criteria that any such legal structure must meet, rather than having to have a certain specific legal structure and all these criteria, uh, which, which leads again to the complexities as to how prescriptive you want to be about um, what your Articles of Association or your Constitution says, and therefore how often you have to, you have, to have another general meeting to change them to keep the, the Scottish Government happy. So um, I, I would say we're, we're very welcoming of, of the broadening of it. It's, it's long overdue, um, but, but why not bring it in, in, in the benefit, um, uh, community benefit societies? On the postcodes, absolutely. Some of the postcode areas, uh, particularly in the Highlands, are very, very large, and it's very difficult to try and... Um, keep the area you, you, you want because you'll end up straying into areas where uh, perhaps you, you, don't, you don't really want. So I'd agree that having you know, the, the proposal to have a, um, uh, you know, discretion to define them in other way is, is very welcome. Um, I mean, there, there are issues there too. Uh, some, some of the, the, um, the area served by the community body um, is, deemed, is my understanding is it's the same as the area um, for, um, for balloting for a particular community asset. But you may, for example, have a community body with a larger area and the, the interest in a community asset is actually quite local, um, but yet all, all the ballots, etc., pertain to the whole organisation. So there's another issue there, perhaps, as far as what you mean by community. If it's a, it's a very effective um, community anchor organisation, for example, serving a wider area, can we have a ballot in a smaller area rather than the whole membership of that wider area? That's another uh -huh. area. But, and just very briefly, finally, on the issue of communities of interest, this is a tool for community regeneration. Um, and uh, you know, we, it goes back a bit to Sarah Jane's point about the, the planning aspect, what's best for this area. Um, it may well be if it fits within what, what has been agreed by the, the local people as being the priorities for their area and would make a difference to their area, maybe the best vehicle is indeed a community uh, of interest as, again, the, the actual body that carries forward that. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, um, in relation to the sort of the form that an organisation needs to take, I touched on this in my response to the call for evidence. Um, there is another way to do it, perhaps, in terms of saying... What, whichever organisation you are, the important thing is the rules that that, cons that, that, that organisation abides by in its constitution. And a comparator jurisdiction for this is South Africa. With some, they've had something called communal property associations. They introduced that in the 90s. And the, they have to register their constitution. And obviously, they wouldn't be able to get that constitution registered, wherever that registration process might be. So I'm afraid to mention registration in the context of the debate today. But it would be a, a repository for these community organisations to see what these rules are, and then irrespective of whether you were a SKI or a BENCOM, a community limited by guarantee, a company limited by guarantee, sorry, um, you, you would be complying with these rules, that the, so the stipulations would be there, and you wouldn't be hamstrung by being a company limited by guarantee. It might be another way to do it. Just on that point, Sandra Holmes last week suggested that they had a stock constitution, which they had in the community land unit, or whatever it's called now, in HI. Um, are you suggesting that we should try to adopt a particular basic constitution that could be off the shelf? 
Now, I suspect that stock constitution would be a stock constitution for a company limited by guarantee. Yeah. So you, you'd almost want to carve out the bits of that stock constitution, assuming it was a model for, for the use. You'd carve out the bits that pertain specifically yeah. to a company limited by guarantee yeah. and leave in the things that relate to the asset, the community, and, and provided that the community was able to form which, whichever vehicle they chose as most suitable for them, which in some cases might even involve someone like a local charity who's got a similar interest coming on board, and it's whether it's the John Muir Trust or the RSPB, I know these are, that's an emotive issue as well, but someone, someone else who might be, because at the moment it's just a community in terms of a postcode unit. Now, I'm not saying we, we want to sort of open it up in that way, but if, if the sort of underlying community as a, in whatever form it took, was able to say, we have got these rules, we can comply with these rules and these are on record, that might be a more flexible form. Good, right. Sarah Jane and then Rory. I, I don't have anything to add further to the comments about community body, but I wanted to pick up on your on, on definition of community and, and community of geography as opposed to community of interest. A community of geography should include a number of communities of interest. And when you look at what the community needs are, they should be able to weigh up the different uh, communities of interest needs and have a holistic view. The problem when you go down the community of interest route is, of course, each community of interest has a different interest and their sole purpose will be to further the interests of that community. And, and I, I think that's where you actually start creating lots and lots of tensions within community. And again, we go back to community planning. If everyone has a seat, everyone has an equal voice, then the sports clubs, the um, environmentalists, those with housing needs, everything is, is looked at in the round. And I, I think that's what a community of geography, a uh, community of place actually does. So, so I would support retaining the community of geography um, as, as, the, as the community um, definition for community right to buy. That there shouldn't be um, a, the community of, of uh, interest on as 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 part of the definition for I, the. Yeah, I don't think the community of interest should have the same rights of um, to to buy as a community of geography. Uh, Rory, <coughs> thank you. Just to pick up on, on Malcolm's point, there, I would agree. This idea of having, I mean, the legislation needs only to have the criteria that are required to safeguard, um, the, the, if you like, the public's investment if you like, uh, the public benefit. Um, and it's, we'll soon rattle up model um, articles of association constitutions we've already got, as Hyde does, um, and CWA, um, model articles of association for community right to buy or not community right to buy. We've got model skew constitution um, as well, and no doubt we will have a model skew constitution for community right to buy. So we can soon rattle up the model constitutions. You don't need that in the regulation. What you need in the regulation is, is, is the criteria that must be built into these governing documents. Thank you. Okay, uh, John, you wanted to say? Yes, I mean, certainly another vote for fundamentally looking at the char characteristics that you want from a community. Obviously, you need a body that's incorporated, needs to be open, needs to be non profit distributing, and have appropriate sort of wind up dissolution clauses and, and so on. So, those are well understood, and there are models available for the different company forms. The problem is, as soon as the legislation changes, all, all those existing model constitutions then need to go and be re-amended, which is an issue that will arise with some of the provisions in, in, in the bill as presented. What I did want to pick up just slightly was on the communities of interest. That actually, and I'm, it's a dangerous thing, I'm sitting next to two eminent lawyers who may contradict me, but as far as I can see, the existing provisions, the existing act, doesn't actually exclude what I would consider local communities of interest from using the provisions. It, it clearly rules out the RSPB or, you know, some sort of national body or the Scottish Mountain Biking Association, if, if there is such a thing. But it wouldn't rule out, and again, I have no idea if these organisations exist, but, you know, the Thurzo Amateur Dramatic Society could, if they want, you know, if they rented their local playhouse from a private landowner were concerned it was going to be sold from under could it seems to me register an interest in that um, they would have to demonstrate that the use of the land was fit with their objectives which I think they would have no trouble doing they'd have to make a case that them taking ownership was compatible with sustainable development but I think you know those of us who write these applications would be quite happy to 
to write that. They would do some theatre drama work with the school and so on. It would be a brave person who stepped in and said that you know, local cultural development wasn't compatible with sustainable development. Probably the biggest issue they would find would be that they'd then, if it did come on the market, they'd have to have a ballot of the whole town. And so there would be a big job of, you know, there's about 8,000 people in Thurso, so that's an electorate of 6,500. They would need to get a significant number of the people in the town to turn out to vote for them. But I don't think that's insurmountable. So, so I think there is a mechanism for it to happen. It just probably hasn't been picked up. It would be much more difficult, I suspect, when you scale that up to, the, to a bigger urban scale. Again, I don't know if there is such an organisation, but the Glasgow Muslim Women's Cultural Centre would have a, a, fa a fairly relatively narrow small proportion of membership if they were expected to ballot the whole of Glasgow. Then, then clearly that's not going to work. But as far as it sits with kind of relatively local communities of interest, it seems that they can go through. And some of those registrations that exist are, to some extent, that. I mean, in Forres, which is a town of almost 10,000 people, there is an active, or there is a current registration on the football pitch. It's not in the name of Forres Mechanics, which is the football pit, the, the team that plays there. It's in the, the Mosset Park protection company i think is the name i may be slightly wrong about that but it you know it's fundamentally a sports interest with a kind of community development bit stuck on Come in, yes could I, could I just ask members of the panel about what they see it as appropriate if anything to be on the face of the bill in terms of this sort of definition or should it be in the in secondary um, legislation malcolm my, my own preference would be for it to be in the primary legislation rather than buried in a regulation. That would be my own preference. OK, shall we move on? Right. I think we should to uh, just a point about uh, issues related to <coughs> procedures and requirements. And we didn't cover the question of mapping uh, uh, when Dave Thompson was talking about some of his questions regarding registration. Now, the mapping question is one which uh, could have been a problem in the 2003 Act. It was in some cases. Uh, I wonder if uh, panels want to reflect on that just now, members of the panel have any views about the detail of the mapping. We, we, you know, we're talking about the registration of croft land virtually in the same detail as that for uh, any sales of house plots or whatever uh, just now. But does the mapping need to be of such a precise nature? We've seen problems about that in terms of the interpretation with regard to part three of uh, the crofting community right to buy in park. Uh, any comments from members? <coughs> right, first of all, Malcolm. Um, the, the maybe the, the quick comment I'd make would be to do with one bit of litigation which happened, I believe, in Kirkcaldy Sheriff Court. It was Kinghorn Community Land Association against Hazel. There, there was an issue to do with the sort of application process did not quite comply with the... The, the mapping requirements, even though in the application form there was a grid reference, it wasn't written on the plan or something like that, and it didn't quite meet up with the legislation, and that ended up with that being bounced. Um, and they, so, so therefore it was a case of community go away, so that's one of the deleted interests in Fife. Um, so in that regard, that does not seem satisfactory to me. Um, there were other reasons, there were, there were other issues with that, um, litigation. It wasn't solely that, but it's something to think about. Um, so, fundamentally, you need, you, you, as, assuming registration, assuming it's, 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 it's a good thing to get everything on notice, then yes, you do need to know what land things relate to. But in terms of strict mapping requirements at a time when a community and volunteers are relying on a lot of energy to comply with a lot of different things, a degree of relaxation and or discretion might might help. Simon Fraser. I think we're still talking about part two, but <coughs> yeah. the lesson has been learned from part three, uh, that it is pretty much impossible to comply. In fact, the two major applications in the island of Lewis, Park and Golson, um, they, they, they decided to map only the common grazing element and not the element where all the houses and people and 
and everything else was simply because that would have been utterly impossible, even to map the common gazing proved extremely difficult. Uh, with a requirement to map every fence, water course, ditch, good and so forth, whatnot. Uh, and that, that was certainly an I would also encourage um, to consider Malcolm's point. Um, the, one of the difficulties that the crafting communities came up against was this the, the sudden death, if you like, element of. Um, Making, making any mistakes and the inability to, to rectify mistakes. I made it in my own submission, there's, there's something about how that, that could be addressed. And I, and I think you certainly want to have the ability to amend the application or to allow the application to be amended in the event of something inadvertently being missed or whatever that would otherwise kill it off. Okay, anyone else on the mapping? Yes, John Hollingdale. I think the second the point about the part three crofting mapping being seen widely as completely over the top and, and impossible to deliver perfectly the first time round on, on the scale of those estates. On terms of part two, it's very noticeable if you look through the documents on the register of community interests that there isn't a, a sort of standard specification for how these maps are pulled up and they, they all look a bit different different base maps are being used, they're demarcated in different ways, and, and it's because no one has sort of sat down and said, this is actually how we want maps presented, and this is this is how you would map an area of 1,000 hectares, and this is how you would map an area of 0 0.01, and it really is like that. I mean, I think the smallest area is probably about the size of this committee room someone's gone through the registration process for, um, and not having a standard model means that people are very much in the dark kind of is this going to be good enough is this what they need and even having a, a, a sort of standard specification this is what you need to do to satisfy and actually drawn out would be a really helpful step we'll explore that with ministers in due course um, abandoned and neglected land we're going to move on to that just now um, and uh, mike russell i think is going to kick off on this one. Thank you very much. Um, I think a common theme amongst all the submissions has been some views on abandoned and neglected land, um, certainly the submissions I've had a chance to read so far. Malcolm described the term as suboptimal. Um, I'd just be interested on your reflections on what could be optimal in terms of uh, how this is described. Whether, uh, because holy, the wholly and mainly abandoned and neglected definition isn't in the 2003 Act of Crafting Right to Buy, what the motivation is for this, um, and some reflections on the difficulty of defining uh, such land uh, in circumstances which does not penalise owners or tenants or others who might be, have different views of how their land might want to, where they might want to operate their land. So I'm simply interested in those views to help the committee come to some mind on it. So Malcolm, for a start. Yeah. Um, so yes, I did say that the word abandoned is suboptimal, but I think there, there's probably there's four key words: the wholly, mainly, abandoned, neglected. And my suboptimal comment was specifically in related in relation to the technical meaning of the word abandoned in Scots law, because when an owner abandons something, that means they are surrendering any right to it. Now it's most easily visualised in the in the case of a corporeal movable object. So if I was to discard this jacket after this session in a fit of rage, then I would lose title to it and abandon property in that context that are under the rules of Scots law, it would, it would go to the Crown. Now, abandoned land is an issue at the moment in terms of there was a, there was a fairly... Well, obviously, you can't throw away land in the way you could throw away a movable item. And there was a recent case to do with uh, the liquidators of a Scottish coal company uh, where they tried to walk away from certain liabilities linked to the land. And the, the, the question of sort of whether you can sort of leave that abandoned and with a non-owner or whether the Crown would step in and whether via the Queen's and Lord Treasurer's remembrance, or, it, it's, it's a difficult one. I'm not going to give you a seminar on that just now. Um, but the very fact that abandoned might have a technical meaning to Scots lawyers in that context, to, to my mind, using it in legislation 
immediately leads to a little bit of ambiguity. Um, so whether you need to explain what you mean by abandoned or whether you need to use a different word to abandoned is something that I would ask for careful consideration of because, as I say, it does have a technical meaning to Scots lawyers, Scots property lawyers. Um, so unused, underused, that I mean, the, these introduce different subjective tests, but at least they don't have the ambiguity factor, if that makes sense. So, uh, so do I have an optimal, optimal word? I was careful not to offer one in my own submission. Um, you then have the sort of the wholly or mainly to, to, to look at the, the, the rest of the, the discussion, uh, the rest of the phrase, um, I suspect the wholly is probably easier to identify than the mainly, uh, because it, it seems to me there's a spectrum there with wholly being at one side, mainly being a little bit less than wholly. And I'm again, it, you, you don't want to say it's a chart of our lawyers or something like that, but you can imagine people having fun with arguments there. You can imagine people having fun. Um, neglected, I, it's also an interesting one because if a landowner came in with a view to create some kind of wilderness wildlife haven and planned purposefully to let land go back to its native state or something like that, has that been neglected if that was his or her conscious choice to, to do that? So, as I say, it's 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 difficult to to to, to propose an optimal word. It's it's always easier to heckle, um, but I, I, in relation to the phraseology, I think specifically abandoned, I think should be carefully considered. Um, the other words need to be talked around. Sarah Jane. I think quite a lot of comments were written uh, prior to discussions we've now had with the Scottish Government about what um, abandoned and neglected actually may be defined and the fact that they, they plan, I think, to suggest that they're included within the primary um, legislation rather than subordinate legislation. Um, like Malcolm, we had real concerns about abandonment because originally we thought it was abandonment of ownership and, and, and had the same concerns as, as he did. My understanding is that what we're talking about here is abandonment um, from its original use. So if you said you were going to create the allotments and that's still sitting there um, used as even a wildflower meadow in, in five years' time, you've abandoned the original use. But have you actually neglected it? No, because you've actively managed it as a wildflower me meadow. But what the provisions say are abandoned or neglected, not abandoned and neglected. So I, I, I think there's still a lot of confusion as to the circumstances under which this provision will actually be used. I mean, when we, when we talked around the table at community empowerment stakeholders, we were talking very much about blight sites. And I think we were all in agreement that there are blight sites across Scotland which do have to be addressed. But those were sites which were derelict, which were really having a, a, a significant detrimental impact on the environment or the safety um, of that community. And those ones were quite easy to, to, um, to identify. But I, I, speaking to... Um, a farmer recently, um, a small farmer down the borders, he runs um, a tiny wee flock of Jacob sheep on a very large field. And if I'm honest, just enough to meet his geek requirements. Now, he has been told by his community that they think he neglects the land. Um, they would like to see, I think they'd like to see it ploughed up, up to the field margins and so, so they can see that he's actively managing. But he is because he runs Pedigree Jacobs. But in their view, they look out and see a kind of scrubby field and a few sheep. So I, I think... Um, I think this is a, a very, very significant issue. I do have some concerns that we've not had to, had time to really go through exactly what this means in, in detail. And as I say, I think we talked about the policy memorandum. You think you know what you're getting with this, and then when you start playing it apart, it seems to indicate something entirely different. Okay, any others? John Holland? Yeah, I mean, we're into parts, parts of A and the sort of absolute right to buy, which we welcome, but I think everybody agrees that these are provisions that will be used very, very sparingly, that they're not there to be used as a run and mill thing, they're the backstop. And that they're you know, one of the, the ideal is that they are strong enough and credible enough that they facilitate compromise and negotiation and that settlements happen that way rather than actually having to, to force sales. But in order for that to happen then they do have to be credible and believable 
that it is in everybody's interest to go to the negotiation process. And if they aren't, or there, there appears to be too much wiggle room, then no one's going to take them seriously. And it's noticeable, you know, part three, the crofting community right to buy, hasn't been a, a huge success, it's fair to say. And that sets two tests for communities, essentially, that have to demonstrate that what they want to do is in the public interest and furtherance of sustainable development. And part 3A adds two more, one of which is abandoned and neglected. And beyond that, even, there's the current ownership being inconsistent with sustainable development, which we really struggle to see what sort of evidence you would need to bring to that. But even with the abandoned and neglected, I think abandoned is probably the one word that everybody <laughs> I've spoken to has a real issue with in this act, because it's very difficult to see how it would work. Um, I'm not convinced that the abandoned and neglected test is actually really necessary. I think most of these things can be dealt with under the sustainable development test. So the, the, the nature conservation issue, yes, I think everybody agrees that non-intervention or very limited intervention in land management for nature conservation purposes is, in, in appropriate circumstances, completely compatible with sustainable development. If it isn't, yeah, we need to have a word with S&H because... They're certainly working under that, under that understanding. And so if a landowner genuinely is setting aside you know, land that's not being managed because he wants it to be wilderness or for nature conservation purposes, you would assume you could assess that under a sustainable development test by reference to is it a designated site? Does he have a, any kind of agreement or even dialogue with SNH about the management or non-management of that site. And it seems to me it could happen under that sort of test that, that we already have and fits with part two and, and part three. And just would the community, interest, community proposals for this land be in the interests of sustainable development? If it's already agreed that sustainable development on this site is non-management because it's, or very limited management because it's deep peat or a precious wildflower meadow, then the community thing would fall. It wouldn't, wouldn't actually make any progress at all. It would, it would stop at that point. The other big issue that strikes me with this neglected is in the circumstances where what the community wants, and again, you're, you are not dealing with the majority of private landowners at this stage at Part 3A. You're dealing with a very refractor a very minority element who are entirely refractory won't compromise won't negotiate you could have a circumstance where the community wishes to acquire 100 square meters to extend the village graveyard because the village graveyard is full do they have to demonstrate that the you know the landowner who owns 10,000 hectares everything around the village is, is abandoning and neglecting the entirety of that estate in order for them to to get this, because this landowner simply refuses to sell a tiny plot of land at any price. And it seems to me those are the circumstances that you actually, most of, most of us would probably say, yes, it probably is in the interest of sustainable development that this happens. It's in, certainly in the interest of the community that this happens. But it's very difficult to see how this abandoned and elected could be made to work in any circumstances. Rory Dutton. Yeah, I think John Stone will smith under, but basically, yes, our question is, is it really workable? And you can see how in, a, in an urban context, which you're, you're talking about um, later on, you know, the neglect may be more evident, but we're struggling really to see how it can possibly be workable in a, in a, in a rural situation. And what I was going to suggest, which John's already suggested, if, if you move the basis in the rural area away from abandoned, neglected, to the... Uh, you know, where there's compelling rural development um, benefits from a small, perhaps a small area relative to uh, the impact that would have on the, the, the greater landholding of the owner, then that would be a far more useful um, mechanism for a rural area than trying to define neglected or abandoned or anything like that. Uh, Simon, please. Uh, very briefly, um, I too find it difficult to understand how this can be applied to the rural context. Um, the test in the crofting community right to buy is, of course, the sustainable development one, and this was um, <clears throat> tested in court. And I'm sure that I'm sure the committee will be aware of Lord Gill's judgment there. Uh, but in, in essence, the 
community were able to meet the sustainable development test uh, as applied to a very extensive area, not to a very small area, but to a very extensive area. So on the one occasion when it has been tested uh, and quoted, it, it, it was able to establish its uh, the case was able to be made. How you could make that with the additional hurdle of abandonment or neglect, I just cannot begin to imagine. Yeah, okay. uh, Sarah Jane Lang, and then back to Mike Russell. J just to come back on that, convener, um, I mean, I, I think we've said before when we talk about rural issues and, and land issues that you know we, we don't always need a one-size-fits-all approach. And if we're all in agreement that this works in urban areas but not rural areas, perhaps that, that what we're looking at is, is, is a different approach um, in, in, in urban and, and, and rural for dealing with this specific issue. Can I just thank you? I, th I think that's been very helpful. I think you've, you've raised the question, even if you haven't actually got the answer to it, and that's, uh, that's a useful step forward. Just in terms of neglect and operation, one of the areas that concerns me most greatly is the question of land held by the public uh, or by ministers and others um, a, and by a variety of, of non-departmental bodies and by local authorities. And local authorities are bound by best value requirements. They have no obligation to maintain buildings, but they have an obligation to try and get best value from them, as we've seen in some celebrated cases, for example, in Castle Tower in Argyll, which is a neglected building, costs a lot of money, but the council seems to have adopted a dog-in-the-manger attitude towards it. But the concept of who owns these buildings and how those buildings might be transferred to community or other uh, ownership without paying a full purchase price to the public purse itself and money circulating within the public realm strikes me as an important one to tackle if we are going to enable more communities to take control. It's a difficult one to see where it fits into the current legislation, but it will have to be confronted. Is there any thinking that any of you have about how we might confront it? Because it does seem to be the biggest barrier for many communities. As well. yeah. uh, who's first? Rory. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to say that you know, we do quite a lot of work with local authorities on asset transfers um, to communities, and we, we try and present it as it's a different scale of public ownership going to community rather than being at a larger. But they, the local authorities, are probably aware, have the 2010 um, regulation that allows them to dispose of for less than full consideration in the light of the wider value that it, that it brings to, um, you know, to, to the public, if you like, to the communities. And we'd like to see that expanded uh, to the other owners. That said, um, increasingly, it's becoming increasingly hard for us to, um, to, to persuade local authorities that that is indeed the way forward. More and more local authorities are looking, particularly when the Scottish Land Fund came back on board, looking, for, looking to getting um, more like full market consideration for, for, for the products. But um, you know, we, we, we would, you know, the, the community asset transfer in the, in the Scottish um, government's definition is about the transfer from public sector to community sector at less than full market value. And we'd like to see that emphasis not being lost because it is, it is starting to become lost even in the wider community asset transfer um, sort of scene. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Jane? I have nothing to add, actually. I was no. going to make the same point as Rory. Uh, Simon and then Malcolm. The big difficulty with that transfer from government is, of course, the public finance manual, but I understand that that has recently been overhauled. I'm not, I'm not aware of the details. I'm not sure how far it's gone. And Mr Russell is, still bears the scars of West Harris and the attempt to pass that across from um, agriculture to the local community. Um, and it, it seems to me that we could probably do with a bit of something in the, in, in the primary legislation here, because in that instance, the public ownership was inimical, inimical to sustainable development, and yet the community still had to pay full value to get it. The, the hurdles there were the public uh, finance manual and the, the ogre uh, of, um, of um, state aid. State aid. State aid. Yeah. Uh, and, and if these can somehow be squared with the with a policy purpose, then perhaps that might be a way through. You know, if it if it were to be covered in primary legislation. Malcolm, and then John. 
everything I was planning to say, Simon's just covered. I was going to make the state aid point. And right, happy. that's good. Thank you, John. Yeah, I mean, we're very familiar in Community Woodlands Association with the operation of the National Forest Land Scheme, um, which in some ways m mirrors but goes beyond what's available with the community right to buy, with communities attempting to acquire from Forestry Commission. And that scheme being a voluntary scheme has been in a, it's been possible to kind of shape it and change it over the eight years of operation to make it more fit for purpose rather than having to worry about primary legislation not allowing you to do things but it has always run up against money issues at the end of it and forestry commission's expectation that full market value um, would be paid which has become increasingly difficult as forestry land has appreciated in value partly as a consequence of, sort of 2008 economic difficulties so that's a, a huge issue I know we're getting into the other bit of the community empowerment bill but that part of the bill the, the asset transfer bit is pretty silent it's one of their issues with that bit of the bill it doesn't really explain how land will be valued and will it be a full market value will it be a, a value that takes cognizance of what the community <laughs> intends to do with the bill so in other words is there a credit for the the additional public benefit which all communities have to demonstrate that they're going to deliver whether they're going through community rights about whatever will that be somehow factored into the the price and so there's some big issues there the other point i wanted to make with um respect to the land reform act is that the majority of the acquisitions that have happened using the community right to buy provisions to date have been from public bodies it's, I think it's nine out of 16. Some of those, some of the public, and, and a number of the registrations that are still sitting there waiting to be activated are also on public bodies like Argyll and Butte Council and Murray Council and so on. So this has been Scottish Water and the Northern Lighthouse Board and so on. I'm not sure how many of those will get moved into the asset transfer bit because there's a list, there's, I think it's Schedule 3 of the bill as presented gives a list of some public bodies that, that will now be subject to the asset transfer provisions. But I imagine some, particularly kind of national UK bodies, I should say, I think will stay within community right to buy. And that sort of bit needs to be teased out how, um, how, how the bill will operate with respect to public bodies, who goes where. And also, does the, the Part 3A rules, will they also apply to public bodies? That's not clear whether a, you know you can a community can start by attempting an asset transfer process under what's part five of the bill, and if they're rebuffed by the local authority, who says no, we aren't neglecting the land, that's fine. Can they then use part three A? It's not clear that there's a, a kind of mechanism or a transfer process there. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, Dave Thompson. Then. Yeah, just a quick follow-on point. Um, it's not only the, the various criteria that have been mentioned already that are going to give difficulty. I, I'd like the panel's opinion on um, uh, 97HD, which is that an additional thing is that um, the applicants have to show that the owner of the land is accurately identified in the application. Um, do you see any difficulties there? Uh, because, you know, trusts can be set up and that there may well be other methods of hiding who the... the um, owner is and does that need to be changed or looked at again john as the the land reform act stands i think in current community right to buy there is provision for communities to be able to put a registration on land without knowing who the owner is they have to demonstrate that they've made reasonable steps or the minister has to accept that they've made reasonable steps to find out who the owner is but if it's not possible to do so then a registration can stand so I think at the very least there ought to be a similar mechanism in here and of course this strikes against the whole abandonment thing because somehow if the land's abandoned that suggests that you wouldn't know who the owner was because they've run away so I, I think there is a sort of bit there it's it's one of those things that I think there's a, a procedural problem in the way that the act was constructed in that most of the provisions in Part 3A seem to have been kind of borrowed wholesale from Part 3. And in that circumstance, if you're talking in the crofting community, I assume it's taken for granted that you know who the landowner is on, on a croft. Perhaps that's not really the case, but it, 
Uh, it seems to me that they've kind of taken from part three and just come across. But there it should be an answer in part two, which is that community needs to demonstrate to the minister's satisfaction that they've taken reasonable steps to, to, to demonstrate who it is, who the landowner is. Welcome. Maybe two points to make. Um, certainly, in relation to what John just said, if, if I was an advocate running an argument about whether or not the land was abandoned and I did not know who the landowner was and couldn't find who the landowner was, that would be a useful aid to my argument, um, whichever word was used, whether it was abandoned or something else. Um, I think the point made about finding out who the landowner is has to be set in the context of the current land registration reforms that are going through at the same time, because the 8th of December, or a few days' time, that's when the new rules are operational for the land register, and you've got a 10-year target for transparency of the, of the land register, which should hopefully assist in terms of working out exactly who owns what. And I also note from the programme for government the, the idea that it has to be an EU entity might be the the owner, which was something that the Land Reform Review Group had proposed as well. So maybe that concern could be mitigated in future years, dependent on completion of the land register. Okay, Sarah Jane. I think to echo what Malcolm said, there's lots of steps being taken to improve um, identification of, of landowners across Scotland. I, I think like the point that was made before about mapping, I, I really do not think it's fair in communities if their application is, is thrown out just because they listed the owner as Mr J Smith, when in fact it's Mrs S Smith. And, and I, I think that's something that we do have to take into consideration, that you should have the ability to rectify it because you have identified the wrong member of the family, but you know it's that, you know it's, you know it's that family. I, I, I think, if, if I'm honest, having spoken to registers uh, of Scotland about this, my understanding is they think this is going to be more of a problem in urban areas than, than in rural areas. There are issues in rural areas about identifi identification of owners. I think we're all aware of that. But um, a lot of the problems, a lot of the inquiries they have are, what are relate to what they called fag ends of land in urban areas where companies have either wound up or ha are, are part of a bigger company and no one's sure who currently owns that piece of land. And I think that's going to be very, very problematic. Rory Dutton, and then I'm just going to add, add just, you know, it, 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 again, go back to the point, these, a lot of these community groups don't have staff, they are volunteers, and I can think of one example where it was actually access to a land, uh, to, to a block of forestry, and, you know, they ended up going across the, transnationally across to Asia, trying to find out who on earth owned these, this land, and, it, you know, I think, I think they were established in 2009 for this asset transfer, it's only happening now uh, for this asset acquisition, so we where you've got um, multiple owners, where you've got um, f people living abroad, it can be very, very challenging to find out who the owners. I'm not familiar enough with the detail to know whether this will all be addressed in forthcoming legislation, but it can be a major issue identifying the owners. Simon Fraser. Yeah, very briefly, I had an experience of uh, successfully in the end acquiring land from a Panamanian trust, but that's the kind of problem you can be up against. And if they choose not to re respond to you, there's perhaps nothing you can do whatsoever. You can't really prove that they've even heard from you. Um, <clears throat> perhaps there might be a, 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 a long-stop provision which would enable some form of edictal citation to be made or some notice posted in the land if all else fails. That's the sort of thing that you can do in other circumstances. Uh, Sarah Jane. Just to pick up on that, I mean, that, yeah, there's lots of precedent set on other pieces of legislation, which is just about you know all reasonable steps, and 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 I see no reason why that can't be inserted into here. Okay, um, a final section kind of thing about the interpretation of sustainable development. The, the issue about the double uh, approach of using public interest and furthering the achievement of sustainable development has been built into the plans now, um, and the inclusion of this double requirement for community bodies, uh, you know, requires, uh, you know, a careful handling. Um, the ministers obviously have to be satisfied if the ownership were to remain in the same hands that it would be, you know, that th these activities might then take place um, and therefore make it difficult for community bodies to, to further the achievement of sustainable development in relationship to that land themselves. Um, do you think that that's a jeopardy for the way in which this has been laid out just now, that community bodies could find themselves caught up by an owner saying, well, I'm about to make some sustainable development? Malcolm. 
it, it's an interesting one, and I'll refer back to Home Hill very quickly, um, because in that case, I understand that there was a planning permission had been granted, and they were able to the landowner was able to say, "Look, my my plans are in the public interest because I have got planning permission." Um, now. Of course, there is a difference between an individual planning application and the wider setting within the land. But yeah, you, you, the, the, the idea that a counter development might be sustainable, I, I don't think you can you can ever shut that down because someone else might might have a valid sustainable development plan, and, and that's fine. I don't think we should be discouraging someone else from putting up that as a counter argument. In fact, if people are putting up that as a counter argument. Okay, great. Um, you, you've, you've, you've encouraged people there. So, I, I, so in part, it could be a problem. But at the other end, if it if if it was to encourage people to engage with things on their land in a way that they hadn't heretofore been doing, then that could be a good thing. Uh, Sarah Jane. I suppose it goes back to what the driver is. If the driver is sustainable uh, development um, in the public interest, then who does it? Um, is secondary. If the driver is sustainable development by a community, then that's, some, that, that's something entirely different. Um, I actually think the provisions in, um, in terms of the, the as, as drafted at the moment, where the owner is given a chance to say, yeah, actually, yes, you're right, I've not done enough of this land, I'll bring it back into use for allotments, are actually very positive because it means that private owners are, are given a chance to say, yes, I'm willing to, you know, to, to, to look at improving the productive use of my land. I think where it will um, have a real impact is on, we, we've talked before about mean well use, that you know, yes, you may have a 10-year development plan, but what are you going to do with that land in the, in, in the meanwhile? And I think it might be sites like that uh, where landowners are quite keen to, um, to think about working with communities for sustainable development in the public interest. But certainly there'd be no reason for um, the transfer of ownership to happen. But we're talking about communities probably having an idea perhaps that they need housing, uh, whereas the landowner might think that sustainable development means building holiday homes to bring in uh, you know, value to the estate. Um, Surely the question about what sustainable development is, in this case, um, you know, as an excuse for not making that land available to the community is something that would be a difficulty for uh, ministers to interpret. I suppose, Convener, you know, we go back to the discussions we had about the planning application. If the planning department of the local authority decided that there is a need for tourism, tourism accommodation and business use on that site and has granted the planning application on that basis then surely the, the landowner is then delivering the public interest. If they've carried out a housing land audit and housing needs and identified a need for housing, and he's not delivering housing on that, on that site, then that's a different, different matter. But if, if you're going to weigh up the need between tourism and business and housing on the same site, then that's competing sustainable development uses rather than sustainable development against non or, or non-development of, of a site. That's a matter of interpretation, I guess. Rory Dutton? We say that you know community trust development trusts are there to make things happen for their communities and you know the, the local businesses local lairds they are part of that community too and if, if, a, if a laird is prepared to do something that's going to you know, push forward uh, the sustainable development of that area that's great it means the community doesn't have to do it so it's a sort of a diff it's going back to this agenda about this, the regeneration of the area or is it a land reform agenda and we take very much the view that it's a regeneration agenda and if the community can can do it where the that the existing landowner doesn't, then, 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 then that, that's the way it goes. But if, the, if there's existing players um, can do it, then and, and they can do it effectively, then, then that should that should be welcomed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John. Um, I just, you know, the context of this is Part Three A, so it's the minority of recalcitrant refractory landowners rather than the the majority. Um, currently, communities will be expected to demonstrate that. The current land ownership is actually <laughs> incompatible with sustainable development, which I think is just an impossible test to pass. But even in terms of the landowner's own plans, I think you have to be aware that landowners will see Part 3A applications coming a long way off because the process is that the community must previously have attempted to buy the land, and it doesn't actually detail what that means. We assume it doesn't mean just sort of ringing them up and saying, we'll give you a tenner for it. It would have to be a kind of properly valued process. And then the community will have had to go through a ballot, which has, in, 
as presented, that's how the process works. So the landowner will have quite a window to know this is happening. And clearly, if it is that minority of recalcitrant landowners, there's an opportunity there to invent a scheme kind of out of thin air. So I think it's important that ministers have the ability to assess the credibility of the landowner's plans. And as you say, it may well be that they have very serious, sensible plans that either they're getting on with or they're waiting to get the finance together with and so on. And those are very good reasons why the community's request doesn't go ahead. But also it's important that it's not a mechanism by which a particularly recalcitrant landowner can simply frustrate the community objectives by pulling something off the shelf or having something that actually isn't all that credible. Indeed. Um, the complexities of this matter are... Uh Certainly uh, something which you've been able to explore with us, uh, and I thank you very much for that. It's very helpful indeed because we're going to be looking at urban contexts and ECHR issues to follow this. But, uh, you know, when we reflect, we may come back to some of you for uh, clarification in any of these points. But it's been very helpful. Thank you to the panel for your evidence just now. Uh, I'm intending to take a break for about five minutes for a comfort break before we start the next session. Thank you.
Agenda item six. Oh, yeah. um, the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. Uh, welcome back uh, to the committee meeting and uh, the evidence session on this bill. The second evidence session today is to focus on urban context and ECHR. And I welcome to the panel Wendy Reid, Development Manager for Development Trusts Association Scotland, John Mundell, uh, Chief Executive Inverclyde Council, uh, Dr Colleen Rowan, a Membership and Policy Officer for the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, um, David Cruikshank, Executive Director, Lamhill Stables Development Trust, <coughs> Susan Carr, Community Alliance Trust, and Professor Alan Miller, the Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Welcome to you all. Um, we have decided on a range of questions just now. We'll no doubt come to you. Uh, the, the microphones are handled centrally. You don't need to switch them on and off. And um, we want to kick off with uh, some aspects of the structure of the the bill as it's been presented to us, uh, Graham Day, first of all. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Good, good morning. I think it still is morning. Uh, I wonder if the panel are satisfied with the extent of the dialogue and consultation on community right to buy that's taking place, and, and whether you believe the extension of community right to buy to urban areas sits appropriately in the context of this bill. Who wants to start first? Right, when do you read? Um, I think from a DTA Scotland perspective, we were very happy with the level of consultation. There's been numerous opportunities to contribute, not just by ourselves, but also our members. So we have found the process very accessible. In terms of whether the extension into urban areas, whether this is the right um, place for that, I think as was mentioned by colleagues earlier, at the time that this came up, there was no obvious other opportunity to address this issue and so in that context it seemed to fit well to allow communities in urban areas the same rights that communities in, in rural areas had had for numerous years. So through a community empowerment perspective it is a thing that is empowering urban communities to the same extent that, that rural communities already have ability to, to take advantage of that, that Okay, anyone else wish to comment on that just now? Not, indeed. Right, uh, the financial memorandum, uh, sorry, the policy memorandum, Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning to you all. Um, it, it's a sort of scene-setting question, really, and it's one I, I put to the, the, the previous panel as well, um, and it relates to the policy memorandum. Um, last June, the convener of the Parliament's Local Government and Regeneration Committee wrote to the Minister for Local Government Planning, looking for some clarification on the policy memorandum. And he was quite critical in a way. He described the policy mem memorandum as little more than a superficial overview. Um, and there was a bit of correspondence here and there, and a bit more detail was provided. Um, but um, my question really is very simple, given the fact that um, the policy memorandum actually devotes less than three pages to the whole of uh, part four of the bill, and at one point summarises 20 sections in, in, I think it's seven bullet points. Um, I, I just wonder what your views are on, on whether the policy memorandum gave you enough content and enough detail to satisfactorily explain the purpose and policy choices and the aims of the bill. And I, I, I'm particularly um, taken by a comment from one of the previous panellists, which said that you, you think you've understood the policies within the memorandum, but the more you pick at it and the more you try to, to drill down into it, you, you suddenly discover it's maybe got a different meaning to the one you thought it had in the first place. And I just wondered if anybody had any comment they want to make on that. Alan? Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission has a very limited, modest engagement with this whole area, and that's why I've been sitting in for the last session to, uh, to educate myself. And I'm so of no doubt that others will have much more insight and experience into um, a lot of these questions. But on that broader policy setting and sort of landscape, um, I, I think that the bill and subsequently the debate and the session I was just listening in on earlier this morning, uh, I'm struck how uh, narrowly framed uh, the debate uh, has been and a little bit embarrassed that human rights and the way it's been interpreted 
has contributed to quite a narrow parameter of debate about land reform and about community empowerment. And if I could just make a couple of points, and then I'm sure others will have um, more value to add than I will, but if we take um, the sort of perception of, of human rights and what relevance it has for your considerations with this bill, the extent to which it appears is that, um, and the language I think is very unhelpful, and I heard it again this morning, and I understand why the language is used about an absolute right to buy. Um, and that the European Convention uh, is not understood as actually providing a framework in which the legitimate rights of landowners and the public interest are reconciled and a balance is struck uh, with compensation of need be being provided to a landowner. But the right to buy is a qualified right. There has to be a competing public interest to override the right to peaceful enjoyment by someone who owns the land. And therefore, the language of a right to buy, an absolute right to buy, to me, has the, it sort of polarises the debate in, a, in an unhelpful way and isn't, isn't a clear understanding of what the European Convention actually contributes um, in, in terms of this debate. But the bigger frustration I have with the policy framework um, is that Human rights doesn't begin and end at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. There is a much broader framework of international human rights which are relevant to you and to the Parliament and to the government, but are largely invisible. Uh, the Scotland Act calls on Scottish ministers to observe and implement international legal obligations. Now, one of these, and only one, is the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This places a duty on Scottish ministers to um, use the maximum available resources to ensure progressive realisation of the right to housing, employment, food, etc. I.e., it sees land as a national asset uh, that is to be used for the progressive realisation of what you might call sustainable development. And, and it's that broader, what I would argue is an impetus for land reform that human rights provides um, rather than an inhibition, which is the way in which it's couched now, does the landowner have a, uh, a sort of red card that the European Convention can use to, to stifle any discussion about a different use of the land? That, I think, is what's missing from the policy framework. And the other thing that I find striking is that next year, um, and this will become real for Scotland the year after, is that we are going to have, at the United Nations level, sustainable development goals and national plans will be required to be developed by all member states, and that will come down to Scotland in due course. So that looking at it in the bigger picture and having a proactive plan for using national asset of land and the resource to achieve sustainable development is really where it's going to be at in two or three years' time. And it's that broader framework that I think we're not benefiting from that, and the debate is suffering and, and being quite confined and quite narrow um, subsequently. And it may be that the, the forthcoming legislation on land reform uh, will, will begin to address that more. I would certainly hope so. But I think the, the way in which human rights has been perceived has narrowed the parameters of this debate and, and somewhat robbed us of the benefit. Um, because I think if human rights is more widely seen in that context, the realisation would be that it doesn't drive you towards courts and lawyers. It drives you, in fact, to having an environment in which it leads to more constructive dialogue between landowners and communities because they know there is this legal framework there that communities will have a recourse to as a, as a last resort if there's a public interest. And the other thing it will do is it will lead to more responsible use of the land, whether by existing landowners or by the public or and communities if they come to take ownership of the land. So I think we're being deprived of the full benefits of an informed human rights uh, framework in which this somewhat narrow, uh, narrowly framed bill and debate is taking place. Mike Russell. Um, Alan, I think that's exceptionally interesting. But if we are going to move from what is a 
a somewhat archaic and old-fashioned view of, of the individual rights of land ownership into a much more informed and illuminated view of the interrelationship between land, uh, the rights of those who live there, and the responsibilities of positive use. How do we construct a, a, a dialogue that allows us to do that? Uh, legislation can sometimes get in the way of having the type of debates that we're having there, but there is a commitment, I think the correct commitment, to a series of, 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 of legislative actions that will take us from here to a better place. What can we put in that allows that process to be more productive, more helpful to everybody involved, and have an outcome in which there is a possibility of reconciling the different points of view for positive change and development? That seems to be a, the human rights challenge to me. You have experience of, of that type of dialogue elsewhere. How do we establish it? Well, I think where you start from is, is very important. And, and I think the bill, um, and, and to, go, to go back to the question from, from Alex Ferguson, the policy memorandum has made it very difficult at this stage to embrace that broader view of the positive benefit of seeing human rights and how it plays out in all these dimensions. Um, I, it, it would, insofar as it does play into this somewhat narrow field, I think it is in the public interest. I think it is in the, the sustainable development and how that is interpreted and applied and implemented. But it's sort of being, it would be being shoehorned in. Um, it may be that further legislation to come, which perhaps sees a broader picture and a broader canvas, uh, would be the more appropriate. And I would hope that the starting point of that forthcoming legislation would be broader than uh, where, we ha where we are to you know, is it. It's like in, in Ireland, if, you, if, you're, if you're asking for directions, and that, where, how do I get there? And you're told, well, I wouldn't start from where you are now, sir. And, uh, yeah, and that's who they are. A very famous book about Irish politics has a title, Phrases Make History Here. <laughs> you know, and, and it's a remark of, of Mahaffey, the, the uh, UK ambassador to Ireland during the Second World War. If you are, are you going to be actively involved in saying in the consultation on, on the land reform legislation that was published yesterday, are you going to make these points actively to the Scottish Government? Because it seems to me that they should be made. We will repeat the points that we made to the Scottish Government with this bill. That at the very outset, we approached the Scottish Government and said this is far too narrowly framed. And if you're talking about community empowerment, you really have to understand what the rights are of the community and also don't let the debate be polarised with notions of absolute right to buy, which doesn't exist. The communities can't be given that. There has to be a, a public interest and a, it's a qualified right. It's not an absolute right to buy. Um, but we, we weren't successful. Um, whether we're more successful the next time um, in persuading the government to have a broader perspective, indications are quite positive that, there, that we might uh, get more reception uh, this time. I think it's correct to say that uh, the Land Reform Review Group report in May uh, has made a big difference to the way in which government will start to look at this, and I would hope you would agree, yes. I think, that's true. I, think, I think we have moved on over the last year or two very significantly, and not just through that, but... Um, other bodies now seem to be more interested in the broader canvas than before. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we, we're going somewhere. Yeah. OK. Um, nobody else want to pick up points that Alec asked there? Um, oh, they do? Oh, yes. Wendy Reid. <laughs> <laughs> Just to feed in from, a, again, our perspective, our thoughts on the policy memorandum, uh, Barring the things that, that have just been said, we actually thought that it was, we were quite comfortable with it. We thought it set out the policy context quite well in terms of setting it in, in relation to community empowerment and what was meant by that and what the purposes of the bill were about. We thought it was quite ambitious. I suppose our question is whether or not the actual bill itself enables that, 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 that policy, those policy aspirations to be delivered. Um, and some of that information, I guess, will come through the statutory guidance and the detail that comes with that as to whether or not the bill will achieve what, it, what the policy memorandum claims that it wants to achieve. We were also disappointed that the word renewal had been dropped from the title of the bill because we thought, again, that set a bit more of a context because, from our point of view, this is really about trying to context, contextualise the fact that this is about renewal and regeneration as well as community empowerment. Community empowerment has to be for a purpose and the purpose to us was about renewal and regeneration and the, and the dropping of the term renewal from the, the title of the bill we felt not necessarily weakened the bill but it didn't necessarily place a context, a useful context on, on community empowerment and left people saying well you know what's all that about. So two points really on that front. 
And our responses to the, the previous iterations uh, of the consultation responses on uh, the bill, we have made the same point. We think that it's a missed opportunity and that community empowerment and real community regeneration, as far as our members are concerned and in their experience in local communities, the two go hand in hand and to separate them is a, a missed opportunity, we think. Okay. Uh, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually think uh, uh, any attempt to try and uh, explain things or contextualise things is a good thing. Uh, the brevity probably doesn't help, bearing in mind the complexity of the issues that are, are having to be addressed within uh, uh, the bill itself. Uh, and one thing that uh, has struck a chord with me through all the discussions, and I've, I've been at committee on this two or three times, is uh, we are being asked to consult and liaise with community bodies. But uh, obviously that is a, a, a restricted number or representation of the, the population. How are we actually going to communi uh, communicate with or consult with the wider population? Uh, and I just wonder if, if we've actually cracked that uh, not yet. Have we done enough to make people understand? Certainly from my point of view, and obviously I, I work in this type of environment, trying to make sure that we liaise with our communities and serve our communities in the right way. Uh, it's very complex, the document itself, and I'm not quite sure we've managed to simplify things enough so that uh, the normal members of the public who uh, are perhaps not immersed in it the same way as we are uh, have the ability to understand what the government is trying to achieve. Um, I think we'll ask some of the specific questions about that uh, very soon, uh, but uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, the uh, financial memorandum, Jim. Uh, good, good morning to everybody. Uh, yes, just regarding the financial implications of, of the bill, uh, the financial memorandum uh, stated that they didn't think there would be any additional costs for government, but was uncertain about the costs for, uh, obviously, ur urban communities and uh, landowners. So I would just like to get the views from the panels, what costs they think may occur for urban communities and, and landowners. David? That's a very deep question, and um, I can only answer it with a broad brush response without going into any of the technical details in, in the bill. But the simple fact is that within urban communities where there is significant uh, deprivation, there is also significant lack of resource. And there is no point in um, floating the possibility of ownership without resourcing it both from a capital perspective and an ongoing revenue perspective. There is no magic wand that is going to uh, allow for uh, deprived communities to suddenly have not only the confidence and experience to own and manage resource, there has to be resource coming into that deprived community or communities to make it feasible. And uh, this can be evidence in several different ways. First of all, <clears throat> the, the, the owners of, of, deprived, um, of land in deprived communities are not necessarily willing to hand over their, their, what they perceive as a potential asset, even though it is in reality probably something of a liability, um, without achieving full market uh, value as they perceive it. For instance, uh, Glasgow City Council has mortgaged all of its uh, redundant land to Barclays at a given market rate and will not release that land unless it achieves the, the market value and it gives the reason for doing that is because it has to honour its, its bond with, with Barclays. Similarly, um, Scottish Water, another example, will hold on to land uh, on the basis that it's an uh, important part of its uh, responsibility to deliver water uh, to the whole of Glasgow in this instance. And uh, despite the fact that the property in which the former water board worker used to live is increasingly becoming derelict and they have no intention of addressing the issue of ownership. And the final point I'd like to make on that on the financial front is that the sources of finance available to community groups that manage to get as far as establishing themselves as credible uh, units um, will tend to require either outright ownership or at least a minimum of a 20-year lease before any sort of investment will come. I'm talking specifically about the lottery, but that's also linked to uh, the, the government 
uh, resources coming through the likes of people and communities and other um, strengthening communities, other avenues that are thankfully opening up. So I would suggest that you, you can't address the issue of, of ownership without having an, a, a resource in the background to, to make that possible. John Mundell. Uh, there are other issues that uh, you, you gave the example uh, a moment ago about the, the city of Glasgow. And there are other uh, aspects of legislation that councils have to comply with uh, in terms of disposal of land. And one of them, the primary one, is uh, basically our duty to ensure best value. And of course, we will always, if we're disposing of assets, be required to uh, obtain uh, best value. And that normally means the market value, whether we're using district, district value or whatever to, to value assets. So that's a key issue. And I don't think the bill addresses that issue at all. Title restrictions is another issue that uh, we have to deal with, and obviously common good, which is referred to in the bill as well, which is a highly complex area, and I think we've actually missed a trick or two with regard to uh, the common good and clarification on what should happen there uh, relative to existing legislation. We'll leave that to Kevin Stewart's committee, and we'll just stick to part four. Mike Russell? Can I, David, just go back to this issue of Glasgow? I, I, that's a bit of a revelation to me. I am a new boy in this committee, but I do find that very strange. So Glasgow City Council, you're telling us, has a deal with Barclays, which means that if there is land which is redundant, it is on bond or promise to Barclays and cannot be accessed by communities unless they pay the full market value. It's not quite as cut and dried. There are several uh, steps along the way, including the fact that the land will be handed from Glasgow City Council to an alio called City Properties, who in turn will engage a private um, uh, maintenance management team called Rydens, and you're dealing with a whole yeah. string of different uh, yeah. pressures. I would also have to stress that speaking as a representative of a community development trust, it's not a good idea for me to alienate my um, uh, potential partners. <laughs> so sure. I'm not going to... Fortunately, uh... I have no such class. <laughs> um, I'm just concerned. How? I wonder if I could ask John, is that a common arrangement or is, is that it's, it's across not, local authorities? Uh, not that I'm aware of and it's certainly one that, uh, dare I say, I, it sounds, uh, well, it creates some discomfort, at least the thought of it, and I would have to understand it in greater detail. Well, inhibition to some of the ambitions within this bill were that to be replicated in any other places. I mean, I have enough difficulties with our Gala Butte Council's attitude, which I shall come on to later, but this is odd. I can possibly comment because I don't know the detail. It would be mm. unfair of me to comment elsewhere, but uh, we are being charged with uh, uh, the responsibility of trying to be innovative in the way that we deal with assets and, and deal with the services that we provide. So uh, it sounds like an innovative idea to me, whether it works out uh, uh, in an appropriate way for, for this bill, I'm not so sure. A non-positive definition of the word. As I said already, it's inappropriate for me to comment on oh. Cox's uh, uh, ideas. Wendy Reid. I, I can't say that I know all the detail, but our understanding of the arrangement was that a number of years ago, Glasgow City Council went round and identified a number of underused or, or unused assets and land and did enter into an agreement. Um, they set up a, a, an alio. That land and, prop that land and property they identified as being potentially of market, of market or use in the market and they went into a, a partnership agreement with a, a company and they did take out a mortgage against the value of, of that land and property. The idea being that they got a lump sum up front and as the, the Alio, the company in Rydens that they went into partnership with, were able to, to maximise the benefit through selling off because they were specialist land agents, that the value that they were able to um, achieve for that would be greater than the value that, that they received from Barclays in the first place, so there would be profits on both sides. What it means for communities is that any building or land that was identified and has been transferred into city property is unavailable for communities to acquire unless they are able to pay the f what they perceive as the market value for it, because it, it, they have to they have to get that back on the, on that property in order to repay the mortgage or the loan that they took out against the the whole. Um, suite of assets in the first place. Now, there will be, there will be nuances to that that we, we haven't really understood, but that's my understanding of the principle of what happened. So it's things that were identified a number of years ago. I don't know whether they are still putting new assets into that portfolio or not. And I also heard that that, that would, the whole arrangement was being reviewed. So 
you know, we couldn't say where the current situation sits entirely, but it did make it extraordinarily difficult for communities in those areas, you know, where there were unused buildings, um, such as schools or whatever, that communities had an interest in acquiring. They were told categorically that they would not be available for asset transfer purposes because they sat within city property. Well, maybe the news will leak out from this committee that uh, there's a considerable interest in this. Uh, um, Graeme Day? Yeah, if I may, just to develop that, if it's possible with Wendy Reid, because I understand John Mundell's in a difficult position, doesn't want to comment about other local authorities, but in your exp uh, experience, Ms Reid, are there other similar arrangements like this that have been entered into in other local authorities in Scotland? Not that we have come across, to be honest. Um, there may have been different arrangements, but nothing like that, and nothing that has been quite so explicit about saying these are, are now out with the control of the council. So what they were basically saying was that Glasgow City Council could not take any decisions on the future of those assets because it was no longer in full, mm -hmm. full control of those assets. They still owned them, technically. We, we found out. But it was extraordinarily difficult to get to the bottom of it because there were a number of different organisations and companies involved in the arrangement. But from a community perspective, what it meant was that they were, they were unable to access mm -hmm. any of those. And it wasn't obvious to begin with there's no, it was very difficult for a community to find out whether an asset they were interested in was, 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 was under the, the, the management of city property or was under the management of Glasgow City Council. Um, you know, it, there's not, there didn't appear to be an obvious place to go to find that information out. So registers of assets as proposed through the bill, would have been ex you know, incredibly useful to know exactly where ownership of assets sat. Because although Glasgow City Council technically still owned them, they weren't in control of, the, of, of actually the disposal yeah, of those assets. Right. Thank you. Susan Carr. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I agree with um, what David was saying about uh, development trusts trying to get onto that first rung is incredibly difficult without funding. Um, I work in an area just five minutes along the road from here in Craig Miller and we've got a similar arrangement in, in, in respect of um, who has control of the land. Um, it's been identified as a regeneration area and to Edinburgh City Council set up a arm's length company to regenerate that. Now the original business plan um, was a profit led business plan which was going to generate income to be able to build new houses. Um, the way that it works is that Park, the, 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 the regeneration company, has first call on uh, an area defined by the Craig Miller Urban Design Framework, which is a red line that goes around most of the area that, that's been either um, demolished or has been lying empty for a while. Uh, that obviously precludes us being able to access this because they have first call on that land. They don't own it. It's still owned by um, City of Edinburgh Council. Um, but any development in there, the land goes to them. And at the moment, um, the way it works is that the business plan originally set up didn't work when the property development area crashed. So did the business plan. And the reason that we have a development trust now is because actually Alex Neil, who was Communities Minister at the time, said that was potentially one of the only ways that we could influence um, any decisions for Craig Miller in the future. Now, we've recently taken over, and with a lease, um, the White House, what used to be a, a notorious pub, but is now a delightful Art Deco building that serves um, really lovely food. Um, and it's a, a social enterprise for us. It, the whole point of it is that we want to try and develop and, and uh, find ways of f um, generating our own um, ability to, to, to fund things. But the, the, the journey that we had to get to take over that was unbelievable. And for a, a small area like Craig Miller, which has such great need, it was a, it was a really difficult journey for us. And we had to go through all of the uh, tendering and, and legals that uh, a, an ordinary developer with loads of money would have to do. Now, I would, I would like to see if there's a way that we could, instead of the communities having the right to buy, because that is such a far-off dream, we'll never have, unless funding is made available, we'll never have that ability. We can have the aspiration, but we'll never have the ability to buy it. Uh, but 
there's loads of opportunities for us to have the right to occupy buildings that are lying empty at the moment and that they actually are contributing to an area in Craig Muller, which is supposedly going to be our new town centre. Um, at the moment, it's mostly a bit of derelict land um, and some shop fronts that are lying empty. Some of the, the, the shop front, quite a sizable uh, building actually, is owned by the council and they are hoping that they're going to be able to um, let it at an affordable price for developers. But it's not affordable. £90,000 for a community group when it needs a lot of work is, is unattainable. But, and I, and I suspect that most people won't want to um, look at it anyway, it's lying there contributing to the, the decay and um, situation that we have in Craig Miller at the moment, that people walk through it and pass it, but they don't actually look at it. It's never open. It looks uh, a disgrace. We could find a use for that but we couldn't find £90,000 to fund it. It may well be that the discussion about local government taxation and uh, the way in which gap sites and neglected sites are taxed might force some changes, but that's up to another body and not this one. Alan Miller? Yes, very briefly. Thanks, I'm, I'm very interested in, in the Glasgow City Council um, issue because I think that uh, that's something that, that could be very instructive um, I think we all would need to know more information about that to understand what the significance of it is. And I certainly understand John's inhibition from being critical of, of um, fellow uh, local authorities. And whilst I'm in a different position and could be, I actually have a lot of sympathy for local authorities because this does resonate with other examples of where they're between a rock and a hard place in many, many cases. Um, if their view is that the determinant decision-making criterion is best value, um, then it makes it very difficult for them to make decisions that perhaps would serve a broader public purpose of sustainable development uh, or whatever. It's not, it's not dissimilar to the procurement regime, where, again, local authorities are feeling quite inhibited that if they're putting out um, services that are going to impact on the quality of, of lives of individuals and communities and if best value is perceived as being the, what they really are primarily accountable to, then it does frustrate very often what they would otherwise like to do. And so I think it does come back to this body, uh, Parliament, and to government to ensure that local authorities don't feel that they do have to enter into agreements, which this may or may not be, um, but which would not be serving the public interest. Uh, Wendy Reid. Just a couple of points coming back to the initial question around financial implications. Um, but before I say that, I just want to come back on the whole issue of best value. It's, it, it's our understanding that best value is not necessarily about achieving best financial value, that there are other aspects that make up best value and that, that there are other considerations that can be taken into account. So it, it doesn't have to always... To achieve best value doesn't always have to mean that you have to get the highest financial um, return... Um, on disposal of an asset. So I just wanted to, to say that from our point of view, we always understood that that was the case. Whether that's actually um, taken into account in a lot of cases is another matter. And, and we understand that local authorities, particularly under increasing financial um, difficulties, so you can see why best value is often seen as, as financial, the best financial um, return. In terms of other financial implications of the bill, I think it's it's partly very hard to tell because it'll all be demand driven which I'm sure you've heard before I think from an urban context um, one of the questions I suppose we have is at the moment rural communities are able to access the land fund in order to help them acquire assets will that land fund now be increased to cover urban areas as well as rural areas I know the, the value of the land fund is going up but actually are the criteria under which communities are eligible is that going to change and the other thing is, is there's a difference between um, financial implications in terms of being able to to support enough organizations in terms of providing them with advice and support as opposed to um, enabling them to acquire resources to actually 
purchase assets and there's two different things there's a monetary implication and there's other implications in terms of, of the, the funding that goes out there are things that are already in place and shouldn't change for instance the government is already supporting the community ownership support service which is there to support any organisation and community organisation that is looking to acquire an asset whether that be in an urban or rural context so there are certain things that are already in place until we know how much extra business is going to, to come out of the changes through the Community Empowerment Bill, it's very difficult to know what other financial implications that will have. Evidence would suggest that the bill itself may not necessarily lead immediately to massive increases in, in, the, in the assets that are going into community ownership. I think it's more likely to, to, to lay down a marker than it is to, to lead to um, significant increases in transfer of property, certainly within the first few years. So, Mike Russell. Yeah, I just want to, if I could tease this out about the uh, best value, and, and because it relates also to the pro topic of abandoned and derelict land, which we're going to come on to later on. There is some land, undoubtedly, in property, which a council will have paid for. They would have bought for a development or whatever, and therefore nobody would expect anybody to, to dispose of that land at a loss to the council. But there are very substantial assets that councils own which they have not paid for which have been inherited for, from a variety of reasons, a variety of people. Now, there needs to be, I think, a definition, and I'd be interested to see if we could come to, towards that definition, of types of land and also the costs to local authorities, because there is legislative opportunity for local authorities to dispense of assets, which are not at best value, if there is another definition. The community interest is one of those definitions. So have councils the will to do so? I would think might, I'm not asking John to speak for every council in Scotland, but do local authorities have the will to encourage uh, transfer of assets to communities? And how can that be done in terms of things that Susan, for example, is identifying? Assets which are actually wasting assets. You know, the property you're referring to is costing a local authority money to maintain and to guard and to, to make sure it does not deteriorate. And, and usually, local authorities are failing to do so. And those assets are deteriorating. This is a much more complicated business. I don't want to disagree with Alan because I rarely do so, but it's a much more complicated issue than saying, let's just, a council has to do this. Property is often not well looked after. Property has not been purchased. The opportunity for communities to make more of it and to benefit communities and therefore the local authority area is great. Do local authorities have the stomach for that or is it too complex for them or too difficult? David and Colleen first and then... Mm. Well, given that the question was to local authorities, perhaps it would be fair. But my point is a development about the resource available to achieve the overall sustainable development and moving away from the strict definition of value being price. So I, I'll hold back and let... Uh, okay, sure. Thank you. Maybe we should do it that way around. Do you feel the same, Colleen, about... Yeah, yeah. Right, to John first. Thank you. Uh, in reality, uh, I'm glad that the, uh, the point of best value is much wider than just money and cash. So that's a, a point that's been well made. However, it's about balance in my mind. So we have to make sure if you've got a, 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 an asset, let's, for argument's sake, might be worth a million pounds and uh, it's been acquired by whatever means. It may well be through common good or inherited in some, what, what, uh, what, uh, some way. Whatever, it doesn't really matter, but uh, you will appreciate that elements of the community would challenge a council who's maybe going to release that property for, let's say, £50,000 because it's got uh, a significant community benefit. There would have to be, uh, uh, that would have to go through the political decision making process and there would have to be a robust argument for us to do that. Coming on to the point of our, or do councils have the stomach for it? I can speak for my own council, and that's why I'm here as far as I'm concerned. Uh, our council absolutely do have the stomach for that, and we are heavily involved already uh, working with community groups, etc., to help them build capacity, to have the skills available to them, and do the hand-holding to help them acquire assets. But I think you've made a very important point as well when you're talking about some assets that are wasting assets, or indeed assets that have failed. And I do personally have a concern in my role as Chief Executive uh, of Inverclyde Council that uh, quite often uh, in these uh, austere times we're looking to transfer assets that perhaps have failed. Uh, why are they failing? Because the community themselves don't see it's a, a huge benefit. Uh, there's not the capacity in the community. Uh, there's perhaps not the interest. In fact, we, we ha had one up in Port Glasgow that uh, uh, was working very, very well indeed. Uh, for, for quite a long time. It was a valuable asset in the, uh, in the community and the people who were involved in running it 
uh, either moved on or chose not to continue. Uh, and then what happens? It's back to the funder of last resort, back to the council, right, what are you going to do about this asset? Now, that asset, in essence, has been transferred uh, and it's being operated, was being operated. It's now shut up. The, 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 the facility has been shut. So what are we going to do in terms of uh, these types of scenarios? And the, another important point has been made, I think it was David that made it earlier on there, about uh, the development trusts. They pay, play a key role in a community as well. They're very important partners down in Verclyde and Verclyde Community Development Trust. Uh, a big part to play. But again, uh, I have sympathy with uh, development trusts and trying to uh, get access to cash. And we have to take on board the point David made uh, about the capital cost, the ongoing revenue. It's the whole life cost of that property. Uh, and that in itself, plus, uh, it's not just the property, the physical asset. It's about supporting the services that are provided within that facility as well. And in the current times, it's really, really difficult to, to do that balancing act. I'm sure you'll appreciate that, uh, where cash is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So that's an important point. And uh, absolutely, without appropriate funds being made, the councils don't have them, right, uh, uh, necessarily at the moment. And we've heard about the bureaucracy and all the rest of it and the legal processes we have to go through for, for procurement, uh, best value. It's just a couple of examples. There's a huge amount. And, I employ a team of lawyers. I have to employ a team of lawyers to make sure that uh, I go through that process and I'm reducing the risk for our council, but more importantly for our community to make sure that our council is running in an appropriate way, as my peers do up and down the country. So, so there's a lot in that, uh, and it's very, very complicated. Thank you. From uh, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Just an observation, because we're focusing very much on local authorities, which was inevitable after David Cruikshank's comment. But I suspect we, should, we could also be talking about the NHS as we see a move away from very old uh, traditional hospital buildings to, to you know, maybe centralising or building new facilities, they'll be in this situation. Perhaps Police Scotland will find themselves in this situation as they close small local police stations. So it isn't just the uh, local authorities we're dealing with here. Let's come yep. back. Uh, my uh, council's headquarters is in the building that was built in the mid-1800s. And uh, I always find it amusing when we're being told to uh, bring all our services together. It was the police headquarters, it was the fire, uh, it's now the fire museum for, uh, it was the Strathclyde Fire Museum, council headquarters, the court, the court for as far as uh, Eaglesome, Govan, uh, etc. And we've moved away from that and picked that and now we're trying to, to bring it all back together again. Uh, and, and obviously things do go in cycles. But that's an important point and, and issues like uh, the integration of health and social care, we did that uh, back in 2010. We've integrated ours anyway uh, uh, before. Yes, we've still got more to do with the, with the, the, the impending legislation etc the changes that are, that are due but we already are looking at jointly uh, uh, procuring uh, GP practices uh, trying to uh, get rid of the uh, bed blocking etc within the hospitals locally uh, and, and we are much more joined up now which is a positive thing where we can reduce the property portfolios for each of the, the agencies involved and, and make our operations much more efficient through cohabitation within facilities there's a long long way to go yet uh, and that might release some of the cash that we need to, to try and help communities. Yeah. Okay. Um, David and Colleen and Wendy, on this point, we've got quite a lot of detail of part four to deal with just now, so uh, be brief if possible. David. Well, I, I'd like to agree with the observation that there's more to this than local authorities. There's uh, NHS, um, Scottish Water, a whole range of public agencies that are in the same boat. Uh, I'm afraid I'm unaware of the questions yet to come, but the one point that I would like to make, which will hopefully come out in further questions, is there, there are other ways of deploying existing resources that will make it possible for communities to um, become empowered both economically, environmentally, and socially. And that's the sustainable development and the triple bottom line, if you like, is the key to the resolution of, of some of these issues that are being raised. So I'll just leave it at that for the time. We will indeed deal with those. Colleen? Um, I would like to uh, return to the Glasgow context. And just from our uh, members' perspective, it's a, it's a mixed picture. Uh, some of our members work very well um, with Glasgow City Council um, and have taken over properties in their, their communities. Similarly, um, we work a lot with uh, the other third sector organisations in the city. And again, the picture is mixed here. And just to kind of go back to, to Susan's point about the right to occupy, uh, the alios sometimes work well 
with local organisations and again sometimes don't work well and we hear stories all the time of the prohibitive leases that um, organisations have been asked to pay which they, they simply can't and also been asked to take over ongoing repairs and general maintenance and these are all obstacles and barriers. Uh, I've just finished by saying John was talking about community development trust and we again work closely with them but I think that the general community anchors in a community are the, the kind of mechanism um, that connects a lot of this activity, what the council is doing, what communities want and these community anchors are really key and I think we've, we've reiterated that in our response. Wendy Reid. Just a very quick comment about um, other public sector assets and the reason why there's been less move, movement of other public sector assets into community ownership is that um, according to the finance manual, those other public sector bodies do have to, to get best financial return, whereas local authorities have a bit of dispensation in that they can dispose of assets at less than market value through the 2010 um, Local Government Act. So I think that's why communities are very interested in other assets, but it's been easier to negotiate transfers of public sector, um, of local authority assets till now um, because of that flexibility that, that there is for local authorities to, to dispose at less than market value or le less than best consideration. Okay. So it would be interesting to see whether there's any review of the public sector finance manual to allow that the other public sector bodies to have the same flexibility. Jim Hume, back to you. Yeah, after it's quite, it's quite just, a long while. Just to, it's more or less a comment, I suppose, but I think we've obviously opened up a can of worms. And <laughs> to put it mildly, I think also uh, it, it said it was a, a mixed picture so from, from different public bodies about the interpretation of what best value is. So I think I'm sure in our deliberations, I think we'll want to explore further if this is just a Glasgow situation and if across other local authorities there's similar and uh, obviously how perhaps other local authorities and public bodies are interpreting what's best value whether it's purely a financial accounting or best value for community so I think we can probably move on. We, we can indeed thank you. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Uh, uh, thanks convener um, just before we do move on uh, just picking up on Colleen uh, Colleen's point, uh, I would certainly agree that not all alleos uh, benefit the local communities that they're supposed to be representing. Um, if we can uh, stick with the financial memorandum, um, uh, just uh, temporarily, um, if, if we do see demand uh, on the Scottish Land Fund budget uh, grow with the extension of community right to buy uh, to urban Scotland, um, which public bodies do you think are likely to be most affected and, and do you think that these public bodies have the expertise and support to advise urban communities? And also, um, what costs do you, do you envisage uh, these public bodies having to bear? David. Well, uh, first of all, I would have to refer you to, to the Development Trust Association Scotland, which is set up specifically to deal with these kind of issues. Um, I'm a member. I'm also on the board of it. So um, I'll leave Wendy to, to, to specify more exactly the, the role that Development Trust can play. In terms of um, the ability to resource and, and sustain community initiatives, and we're talking about community empowerment and renewal, presumably within the context of land reform, I think one of the opportunities that is opening up, and this will open another can of worms, is that particularly in deprived communities where people are dependent on benefit uh, and, and currently administered through DWP, presumably, that there is a way of redeploying that resource where that can serve as a foundation for employment opportunities for people in that community and be built on in such a way that people are not afraid of losing their basic human rights uh, in terms of housing and, and basic money for food, etc. And I think there's an opportunity in, in cultivating communities um, which, is, which is about the, the renewal and the regeneration in, in using that resource far more positively than it currently is used. An interesting point. Uh, Wendy Reid, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is a really hard one in terms of which public sector bodies. I mean, I suppose looking at experience so far in terms of rural communities that have been utilising the right to buy and acquiring, uh, acquiring assets through that, that 
process or actually even not using the right to buy is the main difference between the support that rural communities can access and those in urban is actually about the support and extra resource that high can provide to rural communities in the highlands and islands area which urban communities outside of that area struggle to find us a similar um, avenue of, of support through now there are various bits and pieces that people would say well you could get this and you could get that they're available to communities all over scotland and, and i think in terms of what additional burden there might be or, or finance financial requirement that might be to support urban communities is having something that is akin to the level and detail of support that rural communities are able to acquire particularly around business planning and, and other aspects through high and the additional finances that high can give to um, asset acquisition projects that that other particularly urban communities are not able to acquire at the minute or access at the minute Thank you. Um, you know, clearly, uh, as we've heard uh, from a number of uh, contributors today, that uh, f finance will be will be an issue. Are you aware of any um, funding schemes that are currently available to uh, urban communities, and what additional support is likely uh, to be required to meet the the anticipated increase in uh, applications? Yeah, we um, we could never put figures on it, but at the moment all communities are able to access big lottery money if you're looking to acquire an asset. That funding is available now, but their programmes are up for review. We don't know whether or not the Growing Community Assets Fund will still be the Growing Community Assets Fund this time next year. Um, I would be very surprised, I think we would all be very surprised if there wasn't an, if, if ongoing lottery funds didn't contain some strand of funding that enabled communities to, to acquire and develop and, and manage assets. But who knows what that's going to look like and who knows what sums are going to be available through it. Um, for urban communities in particular, it, they're, you know, they, they're not able to access leader funding because that's again for rural. So I think there's less opportunity for um, urban communities to acquire money specifically around um, asset acquisition than there, than there is for rural communities. If the Scottish Land Fund is going to be um, broadened to enable urban communities to utilise it, then, then that answers part of that question. Not sure whether that's going to happen or not. Um, there may have been some statement about it uh, and that I'm unaware of. Um, I think there are bits of money sometimes within local authorities that people can acquire, but there's nothing specifically for urban communities that rural communities can't access, whereas there is the other way around at the moment. Okay, so Game shooting rates and so on and, uh, are being discussed about being uh, reintroduced or the exemption from yep. non-domestic <clears throat> rates, so they're <clears throat> looking for a top-up of the land fund from that. Yeah, it's whether, it's whether urban communities will be able to apply to the land fund, because up until now it's really been, through, through definition, it's been a rural, um, a thing for rural communities, not urban communities. Oh, we, we will check that out. With Thank you. Susan? I suppose the comment I want to make is really, it's a bit chicken and egg, because um, if you go for a big lottery funding application, you have to have in place um, a, a, a lease of at least 25 years, uh, and to negotiate that, you need funding to be able to get lawyers to support you. So it is chicken and egg stuff because you, you can't just go in and, especially a community like ours uh, in Craig Miller, which is a deprived... We've been in a situation where for years and years people make decisions for us and have done and still are. Um, you know, when it comes to making decisions for yourself, you need to be supported to do that. And... Quite frankly, the idea of taking on a 25-year lease and, and the, the, the ability to fund that is, is a bit overwhelming for some communities. They just don't know where to start. So until you actually give somebody that first step up the ladder, um, it, it's going to be very difficult for people in deprived areas to accept that they have the ability to do this. And quite frankly, you know, I, I hear all the time uh, capacity building. It's, it's not building the capacity, it's releasing it. And that's what really needs to happen. It's there. It just isn't released. There's too many barriers for people to get past. OK, thank you. Um, I think we'll move on to the nature of land and uh, so on. Cara Hilton, 
If you convene our good morning panel. Um, my question ties in a bit to what Susan Carr and Wendy Reid have already talked about. Um, I'd be keen to hear more about how the community rights buy will empower communities in urban areas and make a real difference to people. Um, how, will it, how will it help community confidence, cohesion and sustainability? And when Susan and Wendy talked about the, the funding challenges that face urban communities. Are there any other issues and challenges that particularly affect urban communities? And also any sort of practical problems, um, such as Barham, the one that we heard in Glasgow, so issues such as like how likely is it that community bodies in urban areas could use the new rights to register interest in land that's already subject to a development proposal, just as a way of sort of blocking any development. And I wonder if you would agree as well that one of the unintended consequences of the bill could be an increase in inequalities between communities. Sorry, it's a bit long. That's all right. Let's go. John? Uh, I think that uh, there are significant inequalities within our communities already. And there are impoverished areas, which uh, uh, certainly I see as uh, the primary part of my job, is to make sure that we try and uh, balance the skills for people who are most disadvantaged. So I think there are positives within the bill, but I think technically there are changes that need to be made within the bill to try and help us achieve that. And I've certainly included that in my, my written submission, and uh, I think these things need to be taken on board. Uh, up in Kilmacombe, which is one of the, the, the best healed areas uh, that exists in Scotland, basically, is within my council area, they, they had... Uh, the capacity released. Uh, I take on board the point that's been mentioned and I uh, understand that. Uh, but they had the skills within the community already and it was a limited uh, level of inter intervention that had to be uh, made by the council in that respect. Yes, we went through a whole process and there was power struggles within the community group, that type of thing, until, until things settled down. But it's highly successful in an asset that the council had not managed to continue uh, and investments being made through uh, a, a cocktail of funding through a bid process and all the rest of it. So that's been highly successful. But in some other, other areas, uh, the people who are more disadvantaged, and I absolutely recognise there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of pride in these communities as well, but they do need the support because the skills don't necessarily exist in that area and there's a greater level of intervention required by councils. So anything within the bill that helps us tackle that type of issue has to be a positive thing. But as I've said already, there are a number of technical issues that need to be addressed that I've written, up, written uh, sub, in my written submission, uh, and I'd like to see that dealt with. Susan? Yeah, I'd like to go back to something that was talked about earlier, and that's sustainability. And I think one of the problems that you have with uh, deprived areas is quite often um, we are subject to somebody's great idea of what's going to solve our problems. And those very rarely come from people themselves. So we have uh, a long history in Craig Miller of somebody having this brilliant idea. They come along, there's a project set up, it has its lifespan, and then the funding's removed. And so we start all over again. There's the, the community engagement, which is uh, crucial to this. Um, people in an area like Craig Miller have been consulted to death they could tell you more about consultation than, than the Parliament. But very little of what's said at these consultations um, come into uh, the realisation of what their aspirations are. It nearly always gets twisted. I mean, it's, it's like the funding that we can apply. We have to apply for the funding that people are prepared to give us um, for the activities that they want us to do. <laughs> and I would argue that, actually, if you... Um, empowered people to come up with their own ideas about what the solutions are, then we would have a much better sustainable future for that community. It, the problem is that we've got um, a situation in Craig Miller where we've had more than half of the houses demolished, the, the prices dropped for house building, so no developer is prepared to go in there. So we're now left with a smaller... We once had a community of almost 25,000. We currently have a, a community of about seven or 8,000. We went down to 5,000. Now, you're reducing the opportunity for people to have a say on that because you're almost dismissed as being too small to, to, to be able to reflect what the, the um, area needs. But actually, those are the people who are going to be there long after this regeneration process is uh, completed. So I feel that there's a, a, a need to kind of look at how you can empower people to have a say about 
what is needed in their own area. And quite often, you'll be surprised to find that um, it often concurs with what the local authority wants. It's just a different way of doing it. So, yes, they want new housing. Yes, they want to have um, good facilities and they want a quality of life. No, nobody wants, you know, dog fouling and litter. It's not rocket science. Nobody wants those things. That's what's a consequence. And often that is uh, because of bad design and the fact that they haven't listened to the people at the consultation process about what would work in their area. So I think there is a, an issue um, around uh, deprived areas and allowing them to have the time that it takes and funding the opportunity for them to take on these things themselves. Colleen. I feel I need to come in here and say that um, our model, our members' model, uh, is community-based housing associations is predicated on local people leading and local people making decisions at that micro-neighbourhood level about what's needed in their own communities. I'm certainly not suggesting that you know, CCHAs are a universal panacea or a silver bullet that have solved, um, you know, all the problems. In fact, um, our communities and mostly our members operate in deprived communities. Um, inequalities, health inequalities, socio-economic inequalities have actually grown um, between these neighbourhoods and the rest of Scotland. But I think that releasing or tapping in to what's already on the ground um, our model works. Our members are, most of our members are celebrating uh, 40 years this year, some of them 25 years in the peripheral estates. And um, it kind of amazes us that, you know, it's not lauded and put out there as a, a really good example of um, a resource that's already there in communities and it could be tapped into. It. And we've just put out a new publication, um, CCH is still transforming local communities. And we're willing to talk to the council, to talk to, um, you know, health with regards to um, health and social care integration, for example, um, because it offers opportunities for our members and for local people to be involved in these um, big decisions and processes as we go forward. Very good. Uh, Claudia Beamish. <coughs> Convener, and uh, good afternoon now to the panel. Uh, in terms of moving the discussion forward, I'd like to delve as, as deeply and indeed as broadly as we can into the meaning of community, which is obviously very complex and, and difficult um, and relates both to place and interest. And, and uh, I'm not going to go back to the um, Section 34 of the... Um, 2003 Act, because I think in terms of what the committee would value in hearing from yourselves is your perceptions and your experience and knowledge of where you think this should be going for, for the Community Empowerment Bill. So it is um, uh, to some degree in relation to the comments within the um, context of the bill that's already been made about skills, but also, also comments about BENCOMs uh, the issues around um, the definitions uh, geographically about um, comments in an urban context about postcodes and those complexities uh, and also methods of defining communities of interest such as arts organisations, charities, ethnic groups um, and more broadly uh, for communities. Uh, also, the, the list is, is perhaps as... as never ending as one's imagination but also issues have been very challenging around finding land to grow things and allotments um, allotment societies then of course there's community councils so I, I'm putting all that on the table and asking if you can give any thoughts about whether definitions have to be in relation to specific legal entities or whether there might be um, other ways of defining um, community that would be helpful in taking forward the regeneration and the, and the issues that we've been discussing. Who wants to start? Yeah. John? Yep. Uh, a very challenging question or questions. Uh, to me, uh, in probably the most simple uh, terms, uh, the meaning of community to me is about the people who live together and the relationships that uh, exist between the people in that community, how they interact, how they uh, uh, live in that area and how they make the environment they live uh, uh, 
habitable and pleasant for, for all that are there. Uh, that's my interpretation of it. Uh, I can't remember all, all the parts of your, your, your question, but uh, there, there are, I would like to comment on uh, your reference to the skios. Uh, one thing in the ball there is talking about uh, must not have fewer than 20 members. Uh, I think that's particularly restrictive. We have a couple of skios who uh, are uh, working very, very well. One has eight and one has ten members. Uh, and if we're now going to be saying that, uh, sorry, you don't get, you don't have 20 folk around the table, uh, we know what you're wanting to achieve in this area and we're doing everything we possibly can, but somebody uh, in an ivory tower has said, you've got to have 20 members. Well, we don't have 20 members, but uh, we're an active, uh, progressive community here uh, and we want to make things happen, and they can't because they're barred from it. So that's an issue that needs to be addressed in the bill. Does it have to be as prescriptive as having a minimum of 20 people or 20 members on, on a scale? Three actors understand it, but so it, well, we've looking got forward, we've got an opportunity to, to change comments. it. We've Thank got an opportunity you. to change yes. it. Yeah. Yes. Wendy Reid. Yeah, lots, lots of aspects to your question. Um, from our point of view, we've always looked at community in the same sense that John has, because we've, we come at this from a community-led regeneration perspective and about people living in a place being proactive together to make positive change to that place. So our definition has always come from a geographical perspective, and it's, a, it's, a, it's about community of place as opposed to community of interest. I'm, I'm not really able to comment on the community of interest side because that's not something that we've ever really got in, too involved with. Um, if we are talking about community ownership... The whole thing about having a broad membership, from our point of view, has always been that whatever structure you put in place for a community-led organisation, that actually the, communi the, the democratic control of that organisation is important in terms of, of being able to say that that organisation is accountable to the wider community through its membership, which is why... From a development trust point of view, we've always advocated that, that anchor organisations, community anchor organisations, whether they're development trusts or not, because not all anchor organisations are development trusts, should have as broad a membership as possible because it's that membership that reflects the views of the wider community to the organisation which then acts on their behalf. Whether you, you can do that in a number of ways. You can do that through a company limited by guarantee. You can do that through a skewer structure. You can also do it through um, a community benefit society. Because in all of those structures, you can, you can have the values represented of democratic accountability, of membership, of um, you know, being voted. So the other thing about being community-led, from our point of view, is that the members should have an ability to get elected onto the governing body of the organisation. So there's true ownership within the community of that, of that organisation. You can, as I say, you can achieve that through a number of different structures, um, which is why we have always argued that, that you shouldn't limit, you, sh you shouldn't make decisions in the legislation about this structure being better than another structure because there are a number of factors from a community perspective that will influence which structure they think is most appropriate for the things that they want to achieve as, as that community organisation. Um, you know, for instance, the reason people may want to choose a community benefit society is they may want to go down the route of raising finance through doing a community share issue. The only way you can do that is if you're set up as a community benefit society. But actually, the membership of a community benefit society can be as broad as the membership of a company limited by guarantee or a SCIO. So as long as you've got the values built into the structure, which you can have, we don't think the structure should be the limiting factor. Um, in any, in any way whatsoever, because it's got to be about the structure that works best for the, for the things that the community wants to achieve. Um, that, uh, you know, there are new structures being invented all the time, uh, and that therefore there should be more of a broad definition of uh, what the structures should embrace. Yeah. Do you agree? Well, I think so. I think, I think what you can do is you can almost set out the values that you want the structure to adhere to and the principles of how they should operate. And you can then, you can then see how that translates into a number of different structures. You know, people always ask us, what's a development trust? And we say, well, it's not a, a physical thing. It's a way of working and a concept that, that, that demonstrates a certain set of, of, of values and approaches to how you're going to achieve the end result. So... You, we don't know, and communities are, are, are actually 
often ahead of the curve here and that the things that they want to do and the aspirations they have and the creative ways they're thinking about how they can achieve their aims and objectives are often limited by the legal structures that are available to them. So I, I think having a degree of flexibility is, is really helpful, although my understanding is that that's there in, in, in the legislation as proposed because it says, and any other structure that may come along you, you know, could be added at a later stage. So we wouldn't like to see anything that currently exists excluded but you would also want to have flexibility to add later on. Right. Um, Claudia, uh, John Mundell has to leave I, us I, at one o'clock, yes. so I wanted to bring him in on a, a matter related to... I don't, I don't need to come back. You I'm don't? I'm just interested the to listen to people's views. Uh, well, OK, we'll have Susan and David, and then I want to come on to a question to John particularly. Yeah. Uh, Susan? Yeah, going back to your question, it was very complex, but um, my experience has been that Actually, the communities themselves define themselves. Um, so, for instance, and they evolve. <coughs> they, they become um, almost redundant. So, for instance, our Community Development Trust came from um, an organisation that would set up as an umbrella organisation for neighbourhood associations across the Greater Craig Muller area. So, we, we, first of all, set up neighbourhood associations instead of tenants and residents groups because we believe that people identify themselves by where they live, not by who owns their house. Um, and then from that we decided that we needed to get bring those together. So we set an umbrella organisation up called the Community Regeneration Forum, which became much more strategic in its approach. And then we discovered when we met with Alex Neal that actually what we really needed was a community development trust. So all of that has evolved over time and, and people buying into it takes time as well because when we first spoke about a community development trust, people just didn't get it because it, it's, it's a new concept and the only way you can actually get people to buy into these things is if they succeed. So we had to get a few things under our belt before we got to the point where people actually want to join it. So we, we started off with probably maybe 100 people coming up, you know, and, and saying they wanted to join. But now, you know, the, the, this uh, Memon Arts states that actually every single person living in our defined area is a member. So every single person has an opportunity to have a say on how we are governed. So it, it's, it's something, I think, that evolves. And David? Right. Um, practical answer to the question, how do you define a community? When a uh, big lottery want you to um, define yourself as in applying for growing community assets, the only solution we found to that was to um, use the community planning partnership definition. So in our case, Maryhill, Kelvin and Canal Community Planning Partnership, because the thing was so nebulous and so many different communities within that uh, interest group that it's very difficult to scientifically define a community, but you have to come up with some answer. That leads to the whole issue of community planning partnerships, which we're not going to go into right now. I can see you saying help, but uh, that in theory, unfortunately not working in practice in my view, is a significant area that needs thorough overhauling and, and fresh input. However, um, the other point to make is there can be an inherent assumption that community is always a positive thing. It's not necessarily. You get community of drug culture. You get community of fear of asylum seekers. You get community of uh, all kind of territorial negativity in gang level where young men from one side of the street are prepared to kill other people from the other side of the street because they see it as a, a territorial imperative that they have to, they have to make their name by, by standing up for them. So there are aspects of, of community that need intervention, in my view, and that raises a whole other issue. But that's my tuppence worth at this stage. Thanks very much. <coughs> We're going to come back to a, a couple of questions on procedures and requirements, but uh, I wanted to touch on abandoned and neglected land definitions before John has to leave us in a very few minutes, because it's particularly interesting from a local uh, government perspective. So uh, uh, I don't know who's going to lead in this. Is it Dave or Mike? 
Dave, yeah. Dave? Yep. Uh, well, uh, morning, panel. Um, the, the, the definition, or the lack of a definition of uh, abandoned or neglected land, I think is something that I would appreciate your, your views on. And also the fact that, unlike the crofting legislation, where um, the, 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 the crofters wanting to, to purchase land just have to show that uh, it's in the public interest, and it's uh, for the good of sustainable development. We've got this additional test about abandoned or neglected and issues around that. And then another one on top of that, if the owner of the land were to remain as its owner, uh, that ownership would be inconsistent with furthering the achievement of sustainable development in relation to the land. So you have to show that as well. And I, I just wonder if you agree with me that those tests taken together, and we've heard evidence before, would make it almost impossible for a community in an urban setting to actually purchase the land that they wished to um, sustainably develop. Susan? Speaking from uh, an area like Craig Miller that's very deprived, um, We've always been quite frightened by the fact that we have a lot of derelict land there at the moment because there was so much demolition. Um, in terms of the owner, the owner is the local authority. Um, and I think because we're based in Edinburgh, it would be nigh on impossible for us to, to come up with um, funding that would meet the local authority's uh, requirements for best value. So we're going right back to that situation where it, it does come down to funding and and I think that it, I don't know about other local authorities but I think in Edinburgh it, that there's such a high value even if it's not as, as good as it might be at the moment on land that people won't release it I mean we've, we, we've been really really strong in our desire to make sure that, that it, none of it is bought and land banked so in some respects, the fact that we have a, a regeneration company that has that red line has probably prevented that from happening. So, you know, it, it is actually quite important. I think it very much dep depends on where the land is, on, on how you would define it. But, I mean, certainly uh, we can identify buildings and things that are just going to lie there until um, somebody thinks it's, there's enough value in the, the price to change it. But I, d I don't think that in bigger authorities like Edinburgh that we're going to ever be able to aspire to that. John. Thank you. Uh, this is a very, very difficult issue. And uh, we, we've been spending tens of millions of pounds on regenerating our area, as most councils do anyway. Uh, and, and we've... We have been transforming our area. Uh, and and I, I'll give you an example. There's one, one site that uh, is owned by uh, an absent uh, owner who is, I think, from the south of England. Uh, in actual fact, I think he may well, and I might be wrong on this, but my un most recent understanding is he may well have passed, passed, passed on. And uh, under the circumstances, that there are all sorts of issues associated with that site. Now, strategically, from a planning perspective and also from a regeneration perspective, it's, it's a fantastic location, all the rest of it, and it's a site that uh, the, the Council and our partners for community planning believe would be a benefit for the area. But with all the, uh, the power, the expertise that we have at our disposal between ourselves and our, our partners, it's nigh on impossible to move that site on. So that, that in actual fact, the site is blocked. And that's for, for us as a council. And I, and I use that as, a, uh, a, as an example in my mind's eye uh, in trying to put myself in the shoes of a community group who want to try and access a, a particular uh, site. And, and you're talking about abandoned or derelict derelict land. Now, obviously down Inverclyde, south of the Clyde, uh, uh, obviously major shipbuilding uh, area in the past. We have developed a lot of the, uh, the riverside already. We've still got a part to go. But some of that land might look great, but in actual fact it's heavily contaminated, heavy metals, all sorts of chemicals uh, and pollution within that land. And you're talking about millions millions to, uh, to uh, decontaminate these sites and make them developable. Uh, so you've got all these abnormal costs in some of these sites as well. So that's, that's a high risk issue. Uh, I doubt very much it exists uh, in uh, Susan's example to the same degree where uh, obviously Cave Muller before was predominantly housing and obviously there's a lot of open space now where the, the sites have been cleared. 
but there will still be an element of contamination. These houses, bearing in mind when they were built, could have had asbestos in them and all the rest of it. Uh, and, and again, that being the case, that makes that site, the costs of these uh, developing these sites so prohibitive. So we have to be very careful in, in what we're doing, and it comes back to the money again. It's proper assessment of the site, options appraisals, and, and coming up with the, the sources of funds. Who's going to pay? Now, obviously, from our point of view, the land that's owned by us, the land that's owned by uh, Peel Holdings or Clydeport, uh, where we're in partnership with them through our urban regeneration company, uh, we set up partnerships with these people. But uh, from a professional point of view, uh, it's mind-blowing the money involved for some of these derelict areas. Having said that, it's the absolutely right thing to do to try and develop these brownfield sites in an urban area because they are a blight. There's no doubt about it. And they have to be brought into effective use for the community uh, and, and the urban areas that, uh, 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 where they exist. Just in case Mike has got a supplementary, perhaps it's for John, just so that we don't... It is. I, I, just, I think it's always possible to find reasons not to do things. And I, I do understand the question of contamination and other things like that. But let's take other examples of buildings. You know, the, the local authorities will hold a, a, and own a substantial number of buildings many of which they will attempt to sell. But, you know, the state of the market, the nature of the building, you know, may create those difficulties. The authority will be spending substantial sums on making those buildings wind and watertight. Often it's not possible to do properly, uh, and also making sure they're secure. Where does the balance lie in ensuring that buildings that the council does not want, and which over a period of time it cannot sell, then those are buildings which, local, which communities can utilise for their own purposes. What active work is done on that? Because sometimes it seems to me, and certainly from my own experience locally, that the attitude of the council is the only difference between them and you know, a property developer with a land bank is that they're just not very good at it. You know, and they're leaving this stuff in a bad state, constantly getting worse, and eventually it's bulldozed. Well, well, in Inverclyde, we have replaced every secondary school, So, and I know other councils are doing the same kind of thing. We've completely rationalised our schools of state over the last uh, seven, eight years. Uh, we've still got a way to go in that sense, but nonetheless, that then leaves a number of uh, rationalised properties or properties that are no longer in current use. And obviously, uh, as part of the funding model, which is quite complex for, for, the, uh, for, for our schools, and predominantly Inverclyde has done the majority of that itself uh, through... Uh, reducing the number of schools, uh, getting better uh, uh, numbers in schools, all that type of thing. But part of that funding model uh, relates to the capital receipts that we are, we are due to get when we first set up our schools estate management plan uh, way back prior to the recession. And we've actually factored in the, the, the values that were available at that time for the sale of these assets. It was no longer available, and we took a conscious decision as a council, at least the members took the decision, obviously, uh, to say, right, we're going to uh, stop selling these assets at the moment until the market gets back up to an appropriate level. But we need that cash for, for, for servicing our funding model. It's all part of the, the business plan for the schools estate. You never get the cash. Because that but, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to come on to uh, uh, the issues. Uh, I absolutely agree that there are uh, appropriate types of assets that uh, we could transfer. And the reason I'm, I'm saying appropriate types of assets, if they're a burden to the council in terms of keeping them wind and water tight, they're going to be a burden to a community group. And again, who's going to be providing the funding? It comes back to what I've said as well. It's the old drum that we all beat. There's not enough money. And I know it's more goes beyond that. But nonetheless, if it's a wasting asset at the moment and it's put in poor condition and we believe to uh, provide services, we've got to come up with a, a reduced footprint of our, over our whole estate. In other words, uh, bring it in uh, in size uh, and operate from fewer buildings in a more efficient way, what's left is, is the most inefficient part. And, and I have to say, I wouldn't be comfortable uh, if I'm genuinely here to try and help communities and community groups transferring assets that are a burden. I'd rather end, uh, uh, come up with a way that we can actually perhaps raise these to the ground, the land that's available, that if it's a school, primary school or whatever, an old primary school, it's right in the heart of communities anyway. I'd rather find a way of helping that community uh, or, or group or groups uh, to come up with a new asset potentially. Because again, if they're going to exist for 40, 50 years or longer than that, uh, it's appropriate they too uh, should have uh, uh, modern assets and efficient assets to operate from. There are many circumstances in which communities want to have those assets. They believe they have viable plans for them. They may be assisted by bodies which you cannot get assistance from. For example, in, in the Highlands and Islands, HIE may assist communities to develop and to take forward assets which the council could not get money for. 
So in all those circumstances, do you not think that there's, a, there's an element in which the council might facilitate communities developing their strength and their ability to regenerate themselves rather than simply judging them on the criteria that the council used? We, we, we don't think you're up to this, so we'll just demolish the building. I, I think if, uh, you perhaps misunderstand what I said earlier on. We are proactively involved with community groups just now. I mentioned the issue of a couple of uh, Esquios, for example. We are working with them very, very closely. I have officers that go to regular meetings in the evenings to, to try and develop uh, plans and indeed help people come up with ap appropriate funding plans. Down in Inverkip, we are well advanced in terms of bring, building a new facility down there. Uh, it is obviously going through the planning stage. There are one or two issues at the moment. But we do that anyway. It is not new. Uh, if we can get uh, another organisation, or uh, Highlands and Islands can uh, uh, cast their net wider, it's a different, called a different thing, uh, and it's a different organisation. Fair enough, but it comes back down to the funding pre predominantly, and the will, and the will politically, and for people like me to make sure that we understand we're here to serve the people out there, uh, and, and trying to help them get the right answer. Brief uh, yeah. supplementary to that. Before Thank you. Before John Mandel goes, mm -hmm. just to help us really to get a, a feel for this, because. Through the evidence that we've taken previously, we look at the issue about not being able to identify who the landowner is. And I just wonder, in an urban context, given your experience as a chief executive of council, if you look at blight sites, perhaps in your area, to what extent would there be an issue about identifying who actually owns them, would you feel? Obviously, there's other, other uh, areas that we're being consulted on in terms of uh, the land register and all the rest of it. I think the philosophy behind that is absolutely bang on the button. Uh, I think the aspirations to get that done in a five-year time frame uh, is well uh, over-optimistic, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I think it will probably take about ten years. Uh, it's not a priority for us at this moment in time, given everything else that we're wrestling with, uh, but it's the right thing to do absolutely the right thing to do and if we come up with the, the register and we know who, who owns all the bits of land across the whole of Scotland, well that would make life an awful lot easier. And again, I, I include common, common good in that area as well uh, because there are areas where there are shades of grey as always and the amount of time legally to, to wrestle with some of these issues and including trying to transfer assets to community groups, which is what we are here to uh, talk about just now, uh, that makes it quite difficult. So. That's a great thing to do. Uh, and certainly, my professional uh, association, Solis, believe that's a good thing to do. But the, the timing is probably not on, uh, on our side, or the resources aren't available to deal with that at the moment. So just to be clear then. Right now, the bill was introduced. There, you would anticipate there will be substantial issues there about identifying some site, the ownership of some sites that people might want to take over. Yes, and uh, obviously through uh, the redevelopment work that we do just now, there's still uh, a recent example where it was uh, uh, Peel Holdings uh, down in the waterfront again. Uh, and if you think back how that was transferred, I think all that land along, right down all the shipbuilding area was transferred for one pound, I understand, at least that's what some of the members tell me, many years ago. And uh, obviously we're paying millions to try and get uh, through partnership to get these uh, 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 sites uh, developed. But uh, one site... Uh, we had a boundary fence around one of my operational depots, and we got challenged by Peel Holdings saying, no, that's not where, where the, the boundary is, and the amount of money that that costs just to, to, to sort out one boundary fence, and we're talking about a couple of metres difference on a site that's an industrialised area, heavily contaminated, that type of thing, that's a lot of cash. And, and that's a simple example. Uh, so anything that can help us simplify that process, or indeed... Uh, uh, clear the boards and make sure we, we start afresh and we've got a full detailed register that we know who owns what, uh, it has to be a good thing. Thank you. Um, you may notice other points that are made in the official report of uh, points when you've left, but thank you very much for your evidence just now. Okay. Apologies after leave, yeah. so, but thank you. Um, Dave Thompson, uh, detailed procedures and requirements. <clears throat> Yes, convener. It's um, to do with the, the registration process, really, as, as much as anything, and, and what the panel feel about um, communities having to, to register. I mean, in some instances, it might be very clear <coughs> that there's a, a bit of land that, that the community might want, and uh, an early registration would, would be something that they'd be able to anticipate and deal with. But Often, pieces of land uh, will suddenly come in the market. Uh, we had an example from the Home Hill people last week where a public area that everybody thought was a, a public park suddenly had a for sale sign uh, thrown onto it, the sort of place that people would never have thought about. 
registering, you know, uh, for community purchase. And um, lots of the applications are late registrations at the moment. Um, they're almost becoming the norm. And I'd like to get your views as to whether we actually really need any kind of early registration or should communities just be able to uh, register an interest once uh, a building or land or something comes on the market um, and also whether the registration should be not in relation to a particular piece of land or a building but maybe communities should be able to have register a general interest for a purpose so that if the community has an idea that they would like to develop, I don't know, housing or, or a park area or whatever, they could form a group to register an interest in that purpose rather than in specific pieces of land, which may never ever come in the market. Um, so I'd like your views on that, uh, please. David. Um, I'd like to backtrack briefly and uh, bring a case example that, that bridges into the registering proposal, um, specifically nine and a quarter of acres in our community, which was previously allotment land, uh, deteriorated in the late 60s into kenneling of greyhound dogs for the great local greyhound track, uh, further deteriorated into serious antisocial and criminal base for uh, dogs being kept for dog fighting and guarding of Class A drugs. And this situation perpetuated for 20 years until it was finally addressed from pressure from the local community council uh, to get agencies like the police and the council um, and the SSPCA on board to, to, to support the move to take back that land. Now, the legal reality of that situation is that it is owned by a trust. All of the trustees are dead, and they still have legal representatives who are negotiating on their behalf or allegedly on the behalf of a benefactor of the trustees of Postal Estate, and it's a complete nightmare trying to get to the bottom of the whole situation. There's no recognition of the, the damage that that uh, allowing that land to be, to be a base for antisocial and criminal behavior has, has had over the last 20 years. And uh, I would suggest that the idea of, of people being responsible for the land that they owned and publicly responsible is a, a completely necessary prerequisite. And secondly, just to say simply that yes, to your idea of registering, because if, if a community says, we want this, there should be a way of them being allowed to make that known and then be supported to achieve it in the face of all the other players that have their own agendas and are usually much more um, powerfully resourced than the local community group. So, Wendy, first of all, and then uh, Susan. <coughs> That, that you raised there, Dave, um, the process of registration is about, um, it's quite onerous for community organisations, and I can see why, I mean, what we found that the, that the Land Reform Act has done in rural areas is that it has opened communities' eyes to the fact that they have an ability to potentially acquire land. So while not much necessarily has, has been acquired through the, through the Land Reform Act itself, because it's actually quite difficult <laughs> to go through the whole process of doing that, what it did it, was it laid down a marker and it said to, to communities, actually, this is a reasonable aspiration for you to have, and you have a right to own land, and you have a right to say that as a community you are interested and should be offered the, the, the opportunity to acquire land. And in order for them to register an interest, as you know, they have to set up in a certain way and gather a certain level of interest to, from the wider community to say, we support your registration of interest. In a small rural community, gathering that level of interest may not be that difficult. If you think of urban communities where you have thousands of people potentially living within a... However the community de decides to define its community, you could potentially have thousands of people who are often not particularly engaged in democratic processes anyway. Um, so there's an issue for us about how, you, how a community organisation would go about gathering that first 
hur level hurdle that's put in the way, which is 10% of the community needing to demonstrate um, support. How do they go about doing that? Secondly, once you've got that registration approved, you have to re-register five years later and go through the whole process again. Um, so it, it puts people off. However, having, having to do it does make people assess or communities assess what assets they have and why they might want to register interest in land in the first place. So it does encourage communities to, to start being proactive about what type of community they want to live in and, and the things that they would like to be able to achieve as a result of owning assets. Um, whether there's time, the issue with the late registration is a timing issue. Um, and where things come up unexpectedly, it's very difficult for a community, if they've not thought about it in advance, to go through the process of even gathering the first levels of registration, etc., etc. So I'm in two minds about the registration process, because I think that the, the need to, to register is a prompt for communities to think in a developmental way about, about their community and how they would like to see it develop in the future and, and what opportunities they would like to have in order to, to have an influence over how things develop. Um, but I think the, on, the process is onerous and the re-registration process is onerous. And I think there's something to be said for having an easier process for registering interest if a piece of land comes up for sale that, that the community had never previously anticipated that it might. Because there are things that happen that nobody could have predetermined. Um, and I think in those situations, the way it currently stands, it's extraordinarily difficult for communities to do anything about that. And it might be the loss of a, of a service, it might be, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about getting rid of it altogether, but I can see that there would be advantages of that. But, uh, but I think the, what's been useful about having to register is it has got community organisations to think about actually why they what might want assets and what they might want to do with those things. So we'd want to not lose that prompt um, if we were to go down the route of not having to pre-register interest. Absolutely, absolutely. Susan Carr? Yeah, uh, I agree with what Wendy just said just now, and I can give you two examples of something that's happened just in our area down the road. Uh, when there was, a, you know, the library removed, now, we'd expressed an interest in, in renting it. We know we couldn't um, buy it because of the, the red line that we, you know, that's, that's determined um, as a development area. But we wanted to rent it, and we had to go through the whole process. And actually, the, we lost out for £150 a year because there wasn't anything, any consideration, consideration taken into why we wanted it. We wanted it for a youth zone... Um, and uh, another um, bidder bid £150 more. Now, actually, if we, we could have afforded that £150 more, but there was no acknowledgement that actually what we were proposing for that purpose it was something that was advantageous to the whole area. That We did the same again with another council-owned building just a bit further along the road, and we, we lost out because of that process. I would like to see some way of uh, a community registering um, its, you know, aspiration, I suppose, for a certain use of a building, that, so that we could ensure that it doesn't just go in. The building, the two buildings that, are, that have been taken over by private um, tenants are, are closed for seven, six of the seven days a week. So actually, you know, it's, actually, it's done very little to enhance the quality of life in our area. Uh, but it's two opportunities that we've missed just because we're not being able to, um, I suppose, register that we want it to be used for a certain kind of use. OK. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, I want to try and move on just now to uh, the tests that communities have to the hoops that they have to jump through and you've expressed one of these in terms of just trying to rent a property um, <coughs> the tests well the inclusion of the double requirement for community bodies to show that they're furthering the achievement of sustainable development and for ministers to be satisfied if ownership were to remain in the same hands that it would be inconsistent with furthering the achievement of sustainable development in relationship to the land these tests are in the proposals at the moment. Do you think they're fair? 
do you foresee difficulties for communities with this, uh, uh, meeting the public interest and the sustainable development test? Yep, Susan. I think that an awful lot of that comes down to interpretation. <laughs> and uh, often, I have to say, as a community worker that's worked for 25 years in the voluntary sector, um, what we hear about from Parliament and from government is often quite exciting because we think, Yahoo, they've listened, it's, it's going to happen, we're going to do that. Unfortunately, um, or uh, I don't want to sound too critical of the local authority because they do pay my wages. Uh, but unfortunately, what happens is that um, when it's interpreted by the local authority, they, they somehow seem to fit it into a little box that have immovable sides. So there's no flexibility in that. So it depends on how the local authority officers have interpreted it and, and how much that matches our interpretation of it. So I think there is uh, certain difficulties in each local authority, I'm guessing, will be different. Yeah, uh, Wendy? I would that it be, it's easier for communities to demonstrate and, and pass the first test because mostly what they're about is improving their area, the areas that they live in. Um, you know, that very rarely is a community organisation trying to acquire an asset to do something that, that people don't think is a good idea or is about improving general quality of life for people. I think it's the second that is more difficult because how do you disprove that somebody else is not also trying to achieve the same thing? And I think the second test would be a much harder one to, to um, argue than the first. It's been described as a killer clause. Do you think it is? Yeah, hmm. yeah. Um, anyone with another comment on that just now? No, OK. Well, um, duplicate applications. This occurs, you know, the government or whichever body has to look at different um, proposals from uh, groups. One could be a very positive one. Another one could appear to be a very positive one, but one might be trying to stymie the other. Have you had experience of this in the urban situation? Uh, is it the kind of thing which you think, um, you know, will be a complication in the development of uh, these proposals? Nobody's had experience of that. Yes, Wendy? Leagues that operate in an urban area to see whether they have examples of that. I think there's, there's you know, communities being very, very um, active in their own right. Often we've tried very hard, and I think we've, by and large we've succeeded in trying to get some cohesion into what we're trying to do. So we've, we've made it very open. We've done, um, and, and, and local people are involved in, in decisions and direction that we take. But there's, there's often people who just don't like change. So sometimes it's difficult um, for people to buy into this because they've, and, and certainly in the case of, of, of our uh, community, they've had years and years and years of people telling them, now you do this then you do that and this is the money you're going to get and this is how we're going to do it and then uh, you know, the next funding round, oh no we've changed our mind, you're doing this this way it's very difficult for people not to be drawn to how you're going to get the easiest access to funds. And that doesn't always mean that you're, you're doing what the community wants. You know, every, I've, I've been in a voluntary sector organisation for 25 years, and I've done everything from community engagement to employment and health. I'm now working in a health um, grant because we have to fit into what people are prepared to fund as opposed to what we actually want. And I think that's the difficulty. And often um, you, you're driven by targets that are somebody else has defined as well. So you end up having to contort yourself into the shape that is going to benefit. And what actually happens in my case is uh, we are funded to do A, B and C, but then we do X, Y and Z because that's what the community want. But we have to do that bit to be able to do that bit. So it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, for the communities to be able to direct the funding. It's, it's the other way around. You know, it's, it's um, the tail wagging the dog. So should there be sort of specific mechanisms, you know, for um, dealing with the, the different approaches that we've got? Say there are two applications, you know. Um, 
we need to have a, some means to weigh up one against the other uh, when the, the funding yeah. body or whatever, you know. That, is there? Well, I was going to say there's always, I mean, the, you know, you can't avoid competition and you can't legislate for that. There's got to be some mechanism by, by which you judge two applications on the same criteria and work out which you think is going to be in the better public interest than the other. And, that, you know, people will always come back and dispute a decision that happens all the time. I'm not, I don't think we can avoid some of those things happening, but I don't think we should use that as an excuse not to do things either. Because by giving communities the opportunity to register interest, to put in an application to acquire assets and land, that's something they've not necessarily had been able to do before, and it allows them to, to express their aspirations. Um, and I think just that the fact... What we've experienced before is that the fact that people are able to do it, often things get worked out at community level before it gets beyond that. And I don't think there's been m very many cases where you've got lots of disputes over, over the same thing. It may well happen more in urban areas than it has done in rural. And then it comes down to, I think, a test of what do you... Th you know, if, we're, if you're talking about achieving sustainable development, what does that mean? Who sets the definition for that? And how do those competing applications actually contribute to, towards achieving that definition in that particular place for sustainable development. Do you think everyone should uh, be given copies of the UN International Covenant <laughs> on Economic, Social and Cultural <laughs> Rights and some classes on how to interpret them? Because it sounds to me as though empowering people at a local level with that broader definition with relation to sanitation, food and housing and so on would be very valuable indeed. Uh, I, what I've learned from this session, the previous session, is I don't think any of the communities need very much um, encouragement to uh, empower themselves. It's, I think it is um, those in decision-making, those in authority, that need to be aware more of their duties um, under these obligations. And I, I think that would be much more helpful for, for that greater awareness at, at government level and at parliamentary level. But, I mean, the, 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 some of the experiences and... Not capacity building, but capacity releasing. For me, that, that says it all. And too often, decision makers make decisions with the best of intentions yeah. on behalf of those that they're making the decisions for. And, and that has to be turned in its head. And you don't need international obligations or treaties to... Um, that's just common sense, that, or it should be. Yeah, well, thank you for that. <clears throat> a, a couple of final comments from Colleen and David. Yes, Colleen first. I think probably... Um, Referring back to community planning partnerships, um, which I think is relevant in that the kind of three levels um, that policies and strategies operate at uh, on the ground with local people leading um, the local authority level and obviously the um, Scottish Government level where policies are formulated. And for our members and other third sector organisations, where it falls down is in the community planning partnership structure because this bears very little relation to what people define as their own communities. Um, there's a mismatch between the kind of geographic um, interpretation of what the community is and our members very often do things despite what's happening <laughs> in the community planning partnerships. In other cases, we do work alongside um, the CPP, for instance, in Glasgow, the Single Outcome Agreement, we're uh, working um, on the Vulnerable People's uh, and Homelessness and Housing Need Group, um, and there's some, been some good outcomes achieved there, but I really think that this is, you know, um, it's a well-rehearsed discourse, I know that, that this has been said many times, but uh, it, it really doesn't uh, work. I think that's where it falls down a lot of the time. Well, we've been happy enough to take these ideas forward. David? Um. Very you asked um, if there, were, there had been any examples of competing interests yeah. for a given site. Well, funnily enough, the one example that I could come up with in our community was where a housing association wanted to build residential homes, which is what housing associations do, and the community wanted facilities for... Uh, young people, and there was uh, no doubt about who the winner was because the housing associations were equipped to, to move and deliver. This is not a criticism of housing associations, by the way, but you did ask for an example, and, yep. and there is one. No, indeed, thank you very much. We've covered a wide range uh, today, uh, and uh, it's fascinating for us to be able to try and get as many 
practical examples as possible. I would like to thank the panel for all of your inputs. If you feel you have any other points you wish to make, you are at liberty to write to us afterwards. So thank you for answering a wide range of questions. Um, just before we close the meeting, uh, our next one on December the 10th, the committee will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill and consider petition PE 1519 on saving Scotland seals and its report on, uh, to the Finance Committee on the draft budget, the latter part being taken in private. But um, we have a wide and varied interest in this community and uh, our in interest in uh, urban development has extended the uh, whole scope of this committee considerably, but uh, it's been most useful indeed. So thank you very much. I close the meeting now.